The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Suspense. Stories from the world's great literature of pure excitement. A new series frankly dedicated to your horrification and entertainment. Week by week, from the pick of new material, from the pages of best-selling novels, from the theater of Broadway and London, and the sound stages of Hollywood, will parade the most remarkable figures ever known. CBS gives you suspense. Tonight's presentation is one of the finest of the contemporary stories of mystery and terror. John Dixon Carr's famous novel, The Burning Court. Ah, a glass of sherry by the fireside of a beautiful suburban home. What could be more comforting? You're an admirable host, Mr. Depart, and it's really a shame our first meeting is under such a cloud. It's also a shame I have so little time to tell you which one of your guests here ah, murdered your uncle last week. <laughs> now, let's see now. I believe we're all here. Your wife, your friend, Mr. Stevens, Captain Brennan. Yes, and incidentally, yourself. Just who did you say you were? Well, no wonder you've had so much difficulty with the case, Captain. My name is Cross, Gordon Cross, the writer. As a matter of fact, it's because of my just completed book, Poisoning Throughout the Ages, that I happen to be here now. And Ted Stevens there happens to be a member of the firm which publishes my work. I'd never seen him until tonight, but... I've been told what happened. This afternoon, he began reading my manuscript for the first time on the train. The commuter's train, which every afternoon deposits him safely and soundly here in Crispin. I imagine he was halfway home by the time he finished the first chapter. Then he turned a page. Attached to the following leaf was a picture. And looking at it, the young man stiffened suddenly and all but cried out his shock. It was a picture of a young woman, and under it had been printed Famous Poisoner Marie Dobre, 1676. Ted Stevens was looking at a picture of his own wife. Imagine, imagine his 25-year-old wife in 17th century costume. The face, the features, even a wistfulness of expression were identical. Even the name, Dobre was his wife's maiden name. But no, 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 that was ridiculous. This woman in the picture was, well, one of his wife's ancestors. Yes, that was it, that was it. Simply an amazing family resemblance. Marie would be waiting for him at the station and he'd have to tell her about it. He wondered why, however, she'd never told him about it. Oh, well, but you don't discuss such an ancestor, do you? Ted Stevens glanced down at the chapter to which the picture had been attached. It was entitled, The Affair of the Non-Dead Woman. Hello, Ted. Stevens was almost jolted from his seat. It was Dr. Weldon, professor of English at the college, an old friend of his. Quickly, he thrust the picture beneath the manuscript and moved over. Hi, I didn't see you, Doc. Oh, here, have a, have a seat. Oh, I thought maybe you were giving me the, uh, what do they call it? The brush off? Oh, no, I... Uh, say, as a matter of fact, Doc, you're the one man I do want to see. Yeah? <laughs> Very flattering. Remember those discussions we used to have about murders? <laughs> Better than bridge any time. Well, I got the idea that you'd made sort of a hobby out of the old cases, the historical ones. Well, I've studied quite a number of them, yes. Ever hear of a woman named 
Marie Dobray. Marie Dobray? Marie Dobray. Oh, yes. Uh, that was her maiden name, of course. One of the finest specialists in arsenic poisoning you could ever hope to find. Oh, we're almost at our station, Ted. Let's get to the door. Yes, a real charmer Marie was. Must have disposed of half a hundred husbands, lovers, suitors, and just plain friends before she was caught. Uh, what happened to her, Doc? She was beheaded and burned. Chris Ben! Absurd, laughable. Ted Stevens kept saying this to himself, and yet what he knew was a foolish dread followed him straight through the small suburban station and clung to him as he reached the street. And there in the roadster was Marie, leaning toward him a little to hold the door open and smiling at him. Oh, Ted, what on earth are you staring at? That street light shining on your hair, I like that. Oh, you're tight. Come on, get in the car. Then, like a wisp of smoke, it was gone. The whole ridiculous fear, the delusion. When at home, Marie brought the cocktails into the living room. The logs were burning brightly in the fireplace, throwing a soft, dancing glow upon a room that was darkening with dusk. To you, Marie. And to you, dear. As Stevens placed his glass down, he noticed the manuscript of my book. It was there on the table, right where he placed it when he first came in. Deliberately, he turned from it. And then turned back. The manuscript had been moved. Only an inch or so, but it had been moved. Keeping his back to his wife, he thrummed through that early chapter and discovered just as he knew he would, that the photograph was gone. For a long moment, he thought of what to do. Then slowly, he turned around. This book by Cross I brought home. Yes? Uh, there was a story of Poisoner in it. Rather funny. Her name happens to be the same as yours. Oh, your maiden name, that is. Oh, that is odd, isn't it? <laughs> Darling, was she a relative of yours? Why, Ted, you're serious. In a way, yes. Oh, I don't mean it. it's really important. It's just that, well, when you run across a person who's a dead ringer for your own wife and who lived 300 years ago and was a top-flight poisoner, well, you like to hear about it, that's all. <laughs> what on earth are you talking about? Darling, be honest with me. Didn't you look at this manuscript when I was out of the room? No. You didn't take out a picture of a poisoner named Marie Debray? I most certainly did not. Oh, Ted, what is this all about? What are you getting at? Oh, just this. Somebody took that picture out of that manuscript since I've been home. Now, who's that? Well, I'll take a look. Wait, I don't feel like... Why, it's Mark Depard. Mark? Ted, wait a second. Yes? Ted, whatever it is he wants, promise you won't do it. Promise I won't do I it? I mean, promise you won't get yourself involved. Please, Ted. Don't go out tonight. Say, what in the world is... Well, anyway, we can't let him stay outside. Mark, how are you? Come on in. Thanks, Ted. Just thinking about giving you a call later. Oh, let me have your hat. Oh, thanks. I, Marie, I, I hope you'll excuse me for popping in like this, but, well... I wanted to talk to Ted. It, it's rather important. Well, I don't mind at all. Come on, Mark. We'll step into the library. Oh, you mind, dear? Of course not, Ted. I'll be making the sandwiches for her. Oh, grab that chair in the corner, Mark. Well, let's hear it. What's the trouble? Ted, my Uncle Miles was murdered. Murdered? Oh, the talk hasn't reached you yet. But it's already started. Nothing definite, of course. Just that there was something wrong about Uncle Miles' death. But I don't... Mark, are you sure of this? You know he was murdered? I don't know. Of course I don't. I just don't see how it could be any other way. Uncle Miles, you know, had been sick for quite a while. But last Saturday, he seemed so much better that Miss Corbett, uh, that was his nurse, decided to take the day off. And, oh, well, you know all this. You and Marie were over that afternoon. Anyway, Lucy and I went to the club that night, to that masquerade party, and... 
We left the old boy completely alone. I've cursed myself a thousand times since. But what about your housekeeper, Mrs. Uh, what's her name? Henderson. Wasn't she around? Oh, sure. In that little house out in back. We told her to look in now and then, but, well, that wasn't good enough. It was after midnight when Lucy and I got back. Uncle Miles was dying. Ted, it looked exactly like one of his regular attacks. But then later, after he was gone, I happened to glance under the chest of drawers in his room. There was a small silver cup under there, almost drained, and Uncle Miles' cat. The cat was still warm, but quite dead. Oh. I managed to get the cat out of the house and buried without anyone seeing me. Next day, I had the contents of the cup analyzed. It was poison? Yes. Arsenic. Well, what do you want me to do? Help me open the crypt. What? I want to have a private autopsy performed. Help me get Uncle Miles' body out of that vault. Oh, I know it's a tough job. The thing is sealed solid, but we can do it. You mean without the police knowing about it? Without anybody knowing about it. Mrs. Henderson's visiting her sister, and I managed to send Lucy over to the club. You must be crazy. You're playing with dynamite, Mark. This is something you've got to tell the police now. I can't take that chance. But they'll have to know sometime. You're only I've got to know first, I tell you. You don't understand, Ted. There was somebody in Uncle Miles' room that night, handing him something in a silver cup. Mrs. Henderson was on the porch by the window. She saw her. She saw her? Ted. She thinks it was my wife. Oh, Lucy. It doesn't mean anything to Mrs. Henderson yet, because she doesn't suspect anything, but, well... Ted, you've got to see why I've got to be sure. Why I've got to know how Uncle Miles died. Because it wasn't Lucy, Ted. I know it wasn't. Of course not, Mark. She had an alibi. Well, she was with you at the club, wasn't she? Yes. Except for half an hour. I see. You'll help me, won't you, Ted? When do we start? As soon as you can make it. Okay. Come on now, I'll get your hat. You trot on ahead and I'll come over as soon as I can see Marie. But you're not going to tell her about this? Of course not. I'll think of something. Don't you worry about it. No, that. thanks, Ted. Thanks a lot. Uh, Marie? I'm coming. Uh, darling, uh, Mark asked me to... Uh... I know, Ted. Here, you better take these sandwiches with you. You'll be hungry. Oh, but you knew I was going out? Yes, I knew. You listened to us? I couldn't help it, Ted. I had an idea what Mark's visit was about. The talk about his uncle's death. There's a lot of gossip about it in the village. That's why I tried to tell you why I didn't want you to get mixed up in it. But it's too late now, isn't it? I mean, you're going. I can tell by the way you look. Ted, wait a second. There's just one thing I want to tell you before you leave. And that is that no matter what happens, no matter what you find or think or believe, I love you. You'll remember that, won't you? I'll remember you said so, Marie. By the light of a dim kerosene lantern, Mark and Ted Stevens pounded their way through the thick shelf of rock that covered the Depar's ancestral tomb. Pried open the great slab of stone which lay across the subterranean door, and then at last descended to the dank, ink-black chamber. They found the coffin. They dragged it from its crypt and placed it on the cold stone floor. They unclamped the lid and opened it. Mark! It's empty. What? That's impossible. It can't be. But it is, Mark. You know what this means? That body wasn't in this coffin when it was placed here. I'll swear it was, Ted. From the time that coffin was closed on Uncle Miles, somebody, the undertaker or Lucy or me, somebody was with it until it was buried. And the crypt was sealed right after. Then somebody beat us to it. Somebody's broken in here ahead of us. Broken in? Listen, Ted. Lucy and I have hardly left the house since the funeral. Do you think anybody could break in here? Smash through that stone and cement without our seeing them or without our hearing them? Well, well. What? Well, you might as well come on out then. But who was that? Me, Mr. Depard, up here. My name's Captain Brennan. I'm from the office of the Commissioner of Police. From the... I'd like to talk to you, if you don't mind, Mr. Depard. Here, uh, follow my flashlight up. But I don't understand. Uh, how did you... 
How did you know about this? By listening, mainly. Do you mind if we go up to your house, Mr. Depard? Why, no. <laughs> Not at all. Oh, thank you. Oh, Freddy. Uh, Look here, uh, Captain. Uh, I... uh, Freddy, this is Mr. Depard, Lieutenant Gray. Oh, Glad you. to know you, Mr. Depard. And Mr. Uh, Ted Stevens, isn't it? Well, how did you... How did you know my name? Very simple. I got the names of everybody who was here at the Depard's the day the old man died. You and your wife were included. Oh, here we are. But I don't... Uh, uh, Captain, who gave you those names? Why, your housekeeper, of course. Mrs. Henderson? You didn't think Mrs. Henderson saw the dead cat, did you, Mr. Depart? But she did. She also saw you bury it. And uh, we've been interested in the case ever since. Well, nice place you have here, Mr. Depart. Now, let's see. According to Mrs. Henderson, your wife was wearing some kind of a masquerade costume that night. What kind of a thing was it? Well, it was a... Oh, there, you can see it. It was copied from the dress in that old painting over there. Oh, yes. Hmm. Funny. Uh, where's the woman's face? It's always been that way. Long as I can remember. Somebody must have thrown acid on it or something. <laughs> Can't blame them much. She was a poisoner. A poisoner? Yes. The story goes that one of my ancestors was responsible for her execution. Marie Dobray, her name was. Oh, yes. I've read about her. Learned all the poison tricks from one of her lovers, a guy by the name of Gaudin St. Croix. Gaudin St. Oh, yes, Mr. Stevens. We cops read now and then. Did, <laughs> did you say Gaudin St. Croix? That's French. We call it cross. <laughs> Absolutely no limit to a cop's education, is there? <laughs> but to uh, get back to your wife, Mr. Depart, she was dressed like the famous Marie. Now, when Mrs. Henderson looked through that window... Just a minute, Captain. Mrs. Henderson can't prove she saw a thing, and you know it. Now, what do you mean? I mean you haven't any right to insinuate that my wife was in that room. Well, who's insinuating? I, I'm trying to say that Mrs. Henderson, after thinking it over, realizes she was tricked by the costume. The woman she saw in the funny clothes, handing the cup of poison to your uncle, wasn't your wife at all. What? Because your wife is an unusually tall young woman. And the one Mrs. Henderson saw was fully half a head shorter. More on the order, let's say, of uh, Mr. Stevens' wife. My wife? Captain, Why, this is ri absolutely ridiculous. Well, I don't know. It... All right, what's the matter, Mr. Stevens? You're trembling like a leaf. Uh, tell me now, uh, just for fun, where was Mrs. Stevens that night? She was home with me. The whole evening? Certainly. She retired early? Yes, we both did. You, I suppose, were sound asleep by midnight. Yes, I was. Then how do you know where your wife was? Well, I... Uh, Look I... here, Stevens. She had to have a costume that would match Mrs. Dave Paz. How did she manage that? Where did she get it? Well, she... She never had one. She never had a dress like that. And what about her motive? Why did she poison him? Uh, I don't know. Not for money, suddenly. Then what was it? Hate? Did she hate Miles Dave Paz? Uh, yes, yes, she did. Claire, no! Oh, I, I... I don't know. I don't know, I tell you. Brown. Yes, Freddy. Phoned and got hold of Mrs. Depart and the nurse, all right. That Mrs. Stevens couldn't reach her. Her phone won't answer. Okay, have her picked up. I'm going home. Stevens, come back here. I'm going to get my wife. Oh, man, stop him, Brennan. My name is Cross. Go down, Cross. Cross? Where's my wife? What have you done to her? <laughs> you fiend, what have you done to my wife? You are nothing at all, young man. Here, 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 sit down. You're lying. Something's happened to her. The police just phoned. There wasn't an answer. <laughs> Why are you here? Why am I here? Well, because your wife, reading my chapter on the Dubrays, realized I knew more about the family than even she did. Because she found my phone number on the front cover of the manuscript. And because I know an exceptional case when I hear one. Does that answer your question? No, and you know it doesn't. Can't you see I've got to... I've got to know whether... Yeah, I see. Whether your wife is that Marie Dobre, who was burnt. Burnt by order of the High Tribunal for all poison cases. The burning court of France. Witchcraft. Black magic. The world across the threshold. You're quite sure, no doubt, also, that I'm Gaudin Saint Croix, who first wooed her. No, no, my boy. 
<laughs> no, my real name happens to be, of all things, Tom Simpson. Most unsuitable for a distinguished writing career. And Marie Dobre is no more your wife's real name than mine is Gordon Cross. What? Your esteemed wife was an adopted child, Mr. Stevens, adopted by people in Canada named Dobre. Remote members of the real family of poisoners. I can't believe it. Oh, why? Why didn't she tell me? You yeah, why? Because until I told her half an hour ago, she didn't know it herself. You see, in the course of my research on the family, I found out about it. And in the course of talking with your wife, I found out something else. How for years she was haunted by the fear that she might be a poisoner by inheritance, by blood. And you can see, can't you, why she never talked about it? Her yes. past to you? Yes, yes. And yet, Mr. Stevens, you had all but made her forget that past. You. And that's why she was willing to lie, to steal a picture, do anything, in order to hold you to her. Yes, yes, I, I see that now. You know, young man, I, I rather think she loves you. But as you will see, though, I, she comes only when I call her. Uh, Mrs. Stevens? You mean she's... Yes, Mr. Cross. Marie, it's you. You're all right? Oh, yes, dear. We're both all right now, and nothing can change it ever. Marie, listen. Don't say Marie, dear. Say Maggie. Maggie? Oh, well, that's my name, my real name. Maggie McTavish. And it's a lovely name, dear. The most beautiful, gorgeous... Darling, ever. darling, please. You don't understand. The police, they think you had something to do with Miles' death. They think I did. So, now, Mr. Stevens, before we go back to the Depars, don't you think you'd better tell me everything that's been said and done up to date? Having just saved your wife's soul from the burning court, now I'll rest her body from the electric chair. <sighs> yes, Mr. Depar, truly excellent sherry. Don't you think so, Miss Corbett? Yes. Yes, it's very nice. Well, that, ladies and gentlemen, is how I happen to be here. So let us consider first that supernatural hocus-pocus in the crypt that body that walked out of the sealed tomb, that body that never was in the tomb. Never was in the tomb? No, Mr. Depa. The murderer knew that very soon Mrs. Henderson's story would bring about an investigation. He had to get rid of the well-known corpus delicti. Yes, but who could have kept the body out of the tomb? Who, Mr. Depa? Why, you, sir. What? what, no, what? <laughs> I, I don't understand. Well, it's very simple. You had the opportunity. I believe you said yourself you were alone with the body before the burial. And you had the strength. I dare say you carried it down to the furnace. Where it's now probably nothing but ashes. Ridiculous. Why would he spend an hour smashing into a crypt for a body he knew wasn't there? Why, Captain? Hmm. To impress Mr. Stevens, his witness. And also, apparently, you. Oh, that's perfectly fantastic. Fantastic? <laughs> oh, no, Lucy. Just comic. And I suppose, Mr. Cross, that I also put on a woman's masquerade costume, went into my uncle's room and handed him a nice cup of arsenic. No, <laughs> no, no. That had to be done by a woman. Your accomplice, as matter of fact. Oh, now, come, come, come. You mustn't all look at Mrs. Depar, because Mark Depar's one noble act was his frantic effort to prevent his wife from being charged with the crime. A crime which he and nurse Myra Corbett committed. Myra Corbett? Why, you... Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Stevens, this quiet little lady beside but, me. But why would I do such a thing? Money, Miss Corbett. A cutout of Mark Depar's inheritance. Payments for but, services rendered. That's an absolute lie, Cross. You see, ladies and gentlemen, Captain Brennan never bothered to check Miss Corbett's whereabouts on the night of the murder. Why even think of the nurse? She was the custodian of the old man's health. Oh, you're crazy. You're crazy. And I yet think. who but a nurse could so naturally offer the old man a cup? A cup he was sure contained medicine. You're making it up. The whole thing. You're just and who it but Miss Corbett, living right here in this house, would know what kind of masquerade dress she must copy, would know when Mrs. Henderson would pass the window that night, pass and see her, and accept her, she hoped, for Lucy Depart. No. Oh, that's not true. Oh, yes, Miss Corbett. Yes, Miss Corbett, that dress was the touch that wrecked you. That was your own idea, wasn't it? Not Mark's. You weren't content with a mere murderer's share of the profits. You wanted a wife's share, half of the whole estate. You wanted Lucy Depart convicted and out of the way for good. Mm. Well, I give you a toast, Miss Corbett, with Mr. Depart's excellent sherry to a particularly ruthless poisoner. And yet, you know, on the whole, 
I'm rather partial to female poisoners. Why, only tonight I... I... <coughs> Mr. Cook! What's the matter, Brennan? This man's dead. Dead? Oh, and from cyanide, if I know anything. Cyanide from that glass of sherry. Cyanide that a nurse could get quite easily. That glass was right beside you, Miss Corbett, and nobody else was near it. Too bad he didn't drink it as soon as you hoped. A second ago, we had nobody to use against you. But we have now, Miss Corbett. We have now. And I arrest you for the murder of Gordon Cross. <laughs> months ago that the prominent author was murdered, and tonight Myra Corbett pays with her life for that crime. The former nurse, at first protesting oh, her yes. innocence, in recent yes, cases... Yes, grown... I'm in here, dear. Oh, oh. I thought you might... Well, what did you cut it off for? Huh? What do you mean? The radio. Oh. Oh, yeah, well, I thought you wanted to talk. Oh, Ted, don't you think I know you better than that? What was on the radio? Well, there wasn't any... Okay. It was about Myra Corbett. She goes to the chair tonight. Oh. I didn't think you wanted to be reminded. I don't, really. But making such an effort to hide it only keeps it alive, doesn't it? All right, darling. Know what I came in to ask? If you ordered a cocktail before dinner? The largest one you've got. Fine. I'll get out the ice cube. I know. If I'll fix up the fire. Okay, Maria. A deal. Uh, where are some papers to start it? <laughs> right there by the bookcase. And the name's not Marie. It's Maggie. Because, darling, Marie's dead and gone forever. Oh, no, Marie. We're never dead. Neither of us. It was your hand that touched that glass. I know that now. And I could return the favor. But instead, I shall ask that you dispatch your husband. This one, like all the others. Now, just a little bit of poison in the drink, Marie. Any kind of a drink. What kind, Ted? Hmm? What kind of a cocktail shall we have? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Any kind, darling. Any kind at all. You've just heard The Burning Court from John Dixon Carr's famous novel the first in Columbia's new series of outstanding classics and chills by world-famous authors. Tonight's play, ladies and gentlemen, has one rather special significance we think you'd like to know about. As you perhaps have heard, every fine comedian is said to cherish a secret desire to do an abrupt about face. He pines for the part of a blackguard. Well, tonight you witness the fulfillment of one such desire. The role of that literary and quite infamous diehard Gordon Cross was portrayed by none other than Hollywood's expert provoker of laughs, Charlie Ruggles, here in New York for the world premiere of his latest screen success, Friendly Enemies. The role of Marie? Well, that was enacted by a young lady who long ago won national acclaim as one of Broadway's most accomplished dramatic actresses, Miss Julie Hayden. Thank you, Charlie Ruggles and Miss Julie Hayden, for your splendid performances. The play tonight, as all plays in this series, was produced and directed by Charles Vander, written by Harold Metford and scored by Bernard Herman. Next week, we bring you an intensely exciting and moving drama, The Life of Nellie James. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Suspense. A new series of programs with one strict purpose in view. Your entertainment. Each week at this time, CBS sets aside 30 minutes to excite you, to mystify you, and on occasion to horrify you with a catalog of the world's great thrillers, dramas from the stage and screen, from fiction and radio, dramas that bring you suspense. This, the second offering of a new series, is a unique one. Certainly, it is one of the very few pieces of suspense literature that somehow manages to tickle your funny bone while busily engaged in tingling your spine. Make no mistake, though, nobody's kidding. CBS presents its adaptation of John Collier's well-known short story, Wet Saturday. It's a wet Saturday. Never saw it rain harder. I'm Princey, Frederick Princey, just an ordinary family man. I have a son, a daughter, and a wife. I might be out golfing now if it hadn't been for the rain. I'm Mrs. Princey. I plan to drive over to the nurseries this afternoon for some arbiters. The boarders, you know, but... Oh, the whole lot of them make me sick. Yes, I'm George, son and heir. <laughs> I had a date to go punting. Punting. Couldn't find the blasted punt in this weather, so I'm home too. I... I'm Millicent. I was going to play croquet. That's how I happened to have a mallet. Yes, that's the Princey family. We find them at home. Mrs. Princey, Millicent, George sprawled on a couch, Mr. Princey biting on a dry pipe. Their living room is dull and overstuffed. Rain beats at the windows. They are any middle-class family at home on a wet day, except for one small item. As you sit with them in the living room, you can see through the door to the sun porch a pair of men's feet encased in black boots. They look like the feet of a curate. There's a tenseness in the room. The air is charged with excitement. But the feet are very still. Don't keep staring at them. Listen to me, all of you. Don't you see? They'd hang her. That's what they do. They'd hang her. Oh, Fred, it's too awful. Awful? It's catastrophic. A supposedly sweet, gentle, intelligent girl, respected, loved by the whole village, doing a thing like this. Think of the publicity, the disgrace. You think I'm going to resign from the bench, the vestry, sell out and live in some foggy hotel abroad? Oh, no, no. No. No, I'll kill myself. I will. I will. Don't be a fool. Any more than you have been, the governor means. Be quiet. Wouldn't be so bad if it were you. Everybody in the village knows you're not responsible. George. Yes? Get off that couch. Sit up on your spine. You might be of a little use here if you could think. Listen, Governor, this isn't my funeral. Oh, shut up. As long as I can remember, George, you've been a trial and a tribulation to me. Oh, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. You've got to stand it, my dear. And keep that hysterical note out of your voice. Do you hear? Yes. We are... <clears throat> we are talking about the weather. Now, George. Yeah? George, if he fell down the old well, say, uh, striking his head several times, what about it, eh? I really don't know, Governor. What about it? Don't be an ass. I'm asking you to think. He'd have had to hit the side several times in 30 or 40 feet and, and at all the correct angles. Now, no. no, I'm afraid not. I'm afraid not. We'll have to go over it all again, Melissa. Oh, no, Father. No, no. 
I couldn't. I couldn't. Millicent, we must go over it all again. Oh, Fred, you're torturing her. Oh, face facts, Mater. With him lying there, there's no use pretending it's a picnic. <laughs> they might hang you, Millicent. Oh, stop that shaking. Stop it, here. You must stop it. Just keep your voice quiet. Millicent, we are talking of the weather. Now, we will proceed. I can't. I can't. Not with those boots. Oh, should have thought of those boots, Millie. <laughs> I'm not moving them. Well, sit up, George. Stop shuffling your feet. Now, Millicent, look at me. Answer me truthfully, you hear? Answer me. You were in the croquet court. Yes. Who knew you were in love with this wretched curate? <laughs> Who? The whole village. <laughs> They've been sniggering about it at the pub for three years past. <laughs> ah, what a filthy mess. Millicent, we continue. You were on the croquet court. Yes. You were putting the croquet set into its box. Yes. It, it was starting to rain. I was carrying the balls and mallets into the sun porch. The box was there. You heard someone enter the garden gate and come across the yard? Yes. Could you see who it was? Oh, not at first. I was going into the sun porch. I threw down all the mallets but the red one and turned around. It was with us? Yes. So you called him? Loudly? Did you call him loudly? Could anyone have heard? No, Father, I'm sure not. I didn't really call him. I... I just spoke his name. He saw me as I went to the door. He just waved his hand and came over. How can I find out from you whether there was anyone about? Whether he could have been seen? I'm sure not, Father. I'm... I'm quite sure. So, you both went into the sun porch? Yes, it was raining hard then. What did he say? He said, hello, Millie. And excuse her coming in the back way, but he set out to walk over to Liston. Yes. And he said, passing the park, he'd seen the house and suddenly thought of me. And he thought he'd just look in for a moment. He, he had something to tell me. Go on. He said he was so happy. He wanted me to share it. He'd heard from the bishop he was to have a vicarage. And it wasn't only that. It meant he could marry. And then he began to stutter, get all confused. And of course, I thought he meant me. Don't tell me what you thought. Tell me exactly what he said, nothing else. Well, well... Oh, stop crying. It's a luxury you can no longer afford. Tell me what happened. He said, no. He said, it, it wasn't me. It's Ella Bragdon Davis. And, and he was sorry. And, and all that. Then he went to go. And then? I went mad. He turned his back. I had the red mallet of the croquet set in my hand. I forgot to drop it in the box when he came. I... Did you shout or scream? I mean, as you hit him? No. No, I'm sure I didn't. Did he? Come on, speak up. No, Father. And then? I threw it down. I came straight in here. I went to look for Mother. That's all. My poor baby. No. No one. Oh, leave the child no. alone, Fred. Not such a child, Mater. Hmm, Millie, I had no idea Keep you Keep had... quiet. I'm thinking. Hmm. You see, George, he probably told people he was going to Liston. Certainly no one knows he came here, for he, he didn't decide until he crossed the park. He might have been attacked in the woods. We must consider every detail. A curate with his head... That's a deal. Don't, Father. Don't. A curate, head, 
battered in. Now, who would want to kill with us? Well, I would with pleasure. How do you do, Mrs. Princey? Captain, Captain Smart. Oh, sit down, pray. Mustn't get up for me, Mrs. Princey. You either, Millicent. My word. Just being neighborly on a bad day. I wanted to ask you about those dahlia bulbs, Princey. Took a shortcut on account of the rain and walked right in. Knew you wouldn't mind. Oh, he heard you, Father. <laughs> My dear. We, we, we can all have our little jokes. <laughs> Don't pretend to be shocked. This way, Smollett. This chair facing the fireplace. Sit down, Mother. Well, just uh, straightening the curtains to the sun porch, dear. It looks so gloomy out there. Might as well shut the rain oh, out. Just talking about a little theoretical cure at killing, Smollett. <laughs> you know, young people these days like thrillers. Pass on his side. Justifiable pass on his side. Have you heard about Ella Bragdon Davis? I shall be most properly laughed at. Why? Why should you be laughed at, Smollett? No, oh, and a shot in that direction myself. <laughs> she half said yes, too. Haven't you heard? She told most people. Now it'll look as if I got turned down for a white rat in a dog collar. Oh, too bad. Oh, fortune of war. Yes, fortune of war. Odd how it happens, isn't it? <laughs> Sit down, Smollett. Millicent, console Captain Smollett with your, your best light conversation. You too, Mother. George and I have something to look at outside. Is this rain, you know, very bad, very bad. Uh, come, George. Right, old Governor. Maybe we'll need raincoats, what? Oh, I don't think so. Just make yourself at home, Smollett. Make yourself at home. A cigarette, Captain Smollett? Thank you, thank you. Oh, nasty day to be going out. It's something about the old well, just off the sun porch door, you know. This mm. terrible sodden weather seems to have loosened some of the stones. Oh, too bad. Dash too bad. Spoils the tennis and croquet, I mean, a day like this. Doesn't it, Millie? Doesn't it, Millie? Mm. Oh, yes, it does. She was practicing out on the croquet court earlier, but... Uh, oh, do pull your chair nearer the fire, Captain. It was so damp, we thought it would be cozy to light it. Thank you, I'm quite comfortable. I, uh, I hope you don't feel too bad about Ella Davis. Can't always win. Can't see, though, what you women see in these bloodless clerics. Oh, I always thought Mr. Withers was, uh, is a very charming man. Quite agree, but why should anyone want to marry him? You wouldn't want to marry him, would you, Millie? Not now. That is, I, are you? Oh, oh, no, of course not. Smollett. <laughs> yes, yes, Prince Good Lord, man, you, you come in on a fellow suddenly. <laughs> Guess I did. <laughs> oh, don't mind this old double barrel shotgun. Been working on it. Smollett, may I have your attention for a minute? There's something on the sun porch I'd like to show you. Why, yes. Yes, of course. Smollett, George and I went out to see if we could shoot some rats which have been driven out of the old well by the high water. Afraid they might get into the house. Now you must listen to me very carefully. Very carefully or you will be shot by accident. Princey, what's got into you? You heard me ask as you came in, who would kill with us? You also heard Millicent make a comment, an unguarded comment. Well, what of it? Very little. Unless you were to hear that Withers had met a violent end this very afternoon. And that, my dear Smollett, is what you are going to hear. What? Withers? Yes. <laughs> Who killed him? Millicent. Good Lord. Yes, it's a mess. And of course, you would have remembered... And guessed. Maybe, yes, I, yes, I, I suppose I should. Therefore, you constitute a problem. Why did she kill him? Oh, it's one of those disgusting things. Pitiable, too. She deluded herself that he was in love with her. Good heavens, Millie. Oh, yes, of course, I, I see. He had told her about the Davis girl. I understand. Now, I have no wish, as you will comprehend... 
that she should be proved either a lunatic or a murderess. I could hardly go on living here after that. I suppose not. On the other hand, you know about it. Yes, I see that makes me a problem. <laughs> You're wondering if I could keep my mouth shut. If I promise... I am wondering if I could believe you. But if I promise... If things went smoothly, yes. But not if there was any sort of suspicion, any questioning. You would be afraid of being an accessory. Why, I don't know. I do. What are we going to do? I, I can't see anything else. You, you'd never be fool enough to do me in. You, you can't get rid of two corpses. Oh, I regard it as a better risk than the other. It could be an accident. Or you and Wither could both disappear. There are possibilities in that. Listen, you, you can't. I can, but there may be a way out. There is. Smollett, you gave it to me yourself. I... I did what? You said you would kill with us. You have a motive. Oh, look here, I, I was joking. Of course you saw that. You are always joking. Listen, Smollett, I can't trust you. You must trust me. Else I will kill you now in the next minute. I mean that. You can choose between dying and living. Go on. Now, there's the old well just outside the sun porch door. That's where I'm going to put with us. No one outside knows he has come up here this afternoon. No one will ever look there for him unless you tell them. You must give me evidence that you have murdered with us. I murdered him? Why do you want that? So that I shall be dead sure that you will never open your lips on the subject. I see. What evidence? George, hit him in the face. Sure. George, don't. Ah, ah. Keep out of this. Oh, Captain, you should be more careful. Look what your teeth did to my knuckles. Again, George. Okay. Oh, I can't stand <laughs> it. Oh, can you? Keep quiet. You women keep out of this. I'm sorry, Smollett, but there must be traces of a struggle between you and Withers. Then it will not be altogether safe for you to go to the police. <laughs> Can't you take my word, man? I will when we are finished. George? Yes? Get the croquet mallet. Right, Governor. Take your handkerchief to it. In there, on the sun porch floor. Yeah. Yes. I got it, Governor. There, Captain. There's the weapon. As I told you, Smollett. Now, you'll just grasp the end that mashed Wither's head. I shall shoot you if you don't. But, good Lord, you can't. All right. There. That's it. Now deposit it out by the side of the house, out of the rain, of course. No. Wait, George. Eh? Yeah? First, you'd better pull a few hairs out of his head and put them under the nails of Wither's right hand. Uh -huh. Princey, have you gone mad? Do you know what you're doing? With this gun, yes. Go ahead, George. <laughs> Sorry to mush your hair up, Captain. Uh, uh, oh, shut up, uh, Smollett. There. That's all we need. Now for Withers and we'll fix it right up. Be right with you, Governor. Smollett, you may turn around. Withers is just there in the sun porch. Draw back the curtain. Good Lord, Princey. Yes, messy. But we'll get him fixed up. Now, you smell it. You've just got to drag him through the door and dump him in the old well. <laughs> just beyond the door, Captain. I, I won't touch him. I won't. I... All right. Stand aside. Out of range, George. Right. Only one place I want this bullet to go. Father. Oh, Father. Keep quiet. My aim's none too good. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I... That's I'll... better, smell it. Much better. Go on now. In here... You'll have to take him outside. By the shoulders ought to do it, Captain. Keep quiet, George. Go on, Smollett. Go on. You've seen dead men before. Drag him. Drag him. I'll just hold the gun here to make sure that everything goes all right. Oh, Mother, come away from the dim window, dear. Don't look. But, Captain Smollett, your father is a very resourceful man, Millicent. I'm sure what he's doing is right. But the Captain, I can't, I can't stand it. You mustn't question 
and your dear father. I say, are you two still at it? There's enough trouble around here without blubbering. I'm not blubbering, George Pinsley. So you see, Smug, everything is perfectly safe. They'll never look in our way. Do you see how safe it is? I guess it is. Oh, good heavens, man, you're, you're dripping wet. Why, why didn't you slip your raincoat on? <laughs> Tea ready, my dear? In just a minute, dear. I'll ring for Bridget. Ah, exactly what you need, Smollett. Cup of tea. Best thing in the world to ward off a cold. Sit down, won't you? Oh, don't mind getting the chair wet. Cigarette? Help yourself. I stick to my pipe, you know. Funny Please, how... Mrs. Princey, everything's hot, ma'am. Oh, Bridget, yes. Put the tray in front of me here, on the table. Yes, ma'am. That's it. I say, Captain, you've gone and cut your lip. <laughs> I just knocked it. Oh, how dreadful. Here, Bridget, yes, give yes. the captain this cup. Bye. No, no, thank you. I, I I rather think I'll be running along now, if you don't mind. Why, oh, Captain Smollett, without any tea? Oh, yes. If you don't mind, Mrs. Princey, if, if I could just have my raincoat. Oh, I'll get it for you, Captain. Oh, this is very distressing, Smollett, very. Oh, I, I'll be all right presently, I'm sure. Here we are now. Let me help you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, young man. There. I'd better go out the front way, Smollett. The walk is dry. Oh, let me hold the door for you, Captain. <laughs> Don't worry, old fellow. Don't worry at all. No, no. I... I... Good afternoon. Nothing serious, I imagine. A little rest and he'll be as right as rain. By the way, Millicent, you're not looking any too well. No, not well at all. I'm sure it was that croak he caught. Being outdoors in weather like this is simply foolhardy. The mater's right, Millie. You saw what happened to Captain Smollett. Oh, come along, dear. I shall give you a hot foot bath and put you to bed. And a couple of days in bed, and you'll be fine again. Get plenty of rest, Millicent, and don't worry about a thing. That's the best cure. <sighs> well, I guess I'll have a little rest too, Governor. It's a fine afternoon for a nap. Indeed it is, son. Well, enjoy yourself. I'll see you later. I'll see you all later. Your number, please. Oh, would you get me the police station, please? Police station? Right away, sir. Police headquarters, Sergeant Yancey speaking. Oh, hello, Sergeant. This is Princey of Abbott's Road. I, I believe you know me. Oh, indeed I do, Mr. Princey. Sergeant, a horrible thing has just happened. Quite extraordinary. Murder, in fact. Murder? I am afraid it looks rather bad for, well, for, for a close friend of ours, unfortunately. We saw him do it. I, I think you'd better send someone over right away. Well, our man should be there right about now, Mr. Princey. I... I beg your pardon? I say, our man should be there now. Constable Martin has his post right below your house there. Just rang in. Seems Captain Smollett was with him. Uh, Captain Smollett? He reported some rather queer goings on at your place, but I certainly didn't understand it was murder. Just don't touch anything, Mr. Princey. And don't worry. Don't worry at all. No. No, no, no. I, I won't, Sergeant. Thank you. Governor! Governor, where are you? I'm... There's a man I'm right party. here. Stop shouting! Oh, we... We have some visitors, Governor. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, I, I, I can see that. Well, Constable, good, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Princey. And Smollett, I, I say what a, what a remarkable fellow you are, coming back like this, here to reenact the crime. Only the one against me, Princey. The one against the curate, I'll leave to you people. <laughs> Extraordinary sense of humor. Mr. Princey, I just had a look at what's in your well. Not to pretty sight that, not pretty at all. Yes, Captain Smollett was thorough, if nothing else. You saw him when he did it, sir, out in the back? No, oh, quite. We were just returning from a walk. Smollett evidently had been laying for the curate, hiding out in those bushes by the road, I imagine. He was never inside this house. Never. 
And do uh, you say, Captain? I say that while I was inside this house, a guest of the family, I was coerced into dragging the curate's body outside and dumping it in the well. Well, there we are. Uh, not entirely, Constable. Uh, I'll just remove my raincoat. There. And demonstrate how damp I got my clothes when I went outside without it. No. That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, quite. <laughs> He undoubtedly removed his coat at some point between here and your post. I might as well tell you that his weapon, a red crooky mallet, is out by the side of the house. I shouldn't be at all surprised, but that you'd find his fingerprints all over it. All over the end of the mallet, Constable. The end that mashed withers his head. And not the end I'd have had the grasp in order to do the mashing. Governor, <laughs> that's a decent try, Smollett. <laughs> but it won't work. There must be other evidences, Constable. You'll undoubtedly find them when you examine the body. Oh, he means my hair under Withers' nails. Well, sir, if you look carefully, I believe you'll find a few of my precious hairs under his son's nails, too. Here, what are you trying to... Shut up! Constable, this is an utter waste of time. So far as the violent struggle between Smollett and Withers is concerned, Smollett's face speaks for itself. Quite eloquently, I believe. Oh, but no more eloquently than your son's knuckles. As you see, Constable, a fresh abrasion. He did that on my teeth. Or did he? What? I say, or did he? He might have done that on Withers' teeth. <laughs> oh, I see. I see what you mean. But, but, but I didn't. G Governor, he said I... Oh, keep still, you nitwit. Let me think. Let me think. As a matter of fact, George, the more I think of it, the more I'm convinced it was your voice I heard. Quite a vigorous quarrel. Something about the curate jilting your sister. Oh, don't be ridiculous, Smollett. Very well, Princey. If your son didn't do it, who did? That's what I'd like to know. How about it, Mr. Princey? Well, that... That is a sticker, all right. <laughs> George, my boy, it looks like you're elected. Elected? What do you mean? I didn't do it. Why, I, I had nothing to do... Keep your mouth shut, will you? I won't. I'm not going to take the blame for her. Millie did it. She did it with that mallet, I saw. You could prove that? Prove it? I... I... Yes. Her, her fingerprints on the mallet. The handle. Why, George, don't you remember when you made me touch the mallet? Huh? When you picked it up with your handkerchief? No, I... George, I'm sure you wiped that handle clean. Oh, well, I could hardly expect you to remember that if you, if you can't even remember killing the curate. Governor, I... I told you to keep still. But, Governor, you, you, you're not going to turn me over. You, as you... long as I can remember, George, you've been a trial and a tribulation to me. Governor, I... You shouldn't have done it, son. You really shouldn't. No, George, that was definitely wrong. <laughs> I say, Princey, I think I'll have that cup of tea after all. Nothing like it in weather like this. Wet Saturday, from the short story by John Collier. You have just heard the second in Columbia's new series, a series designed to bring you the best in thrill entertainment. Outstanding dramas from the field of fiction and radio, stage and screen. Dramas of pure... Suspense. This Columbia feature is produced and directed by Charles Vanda, with script by Harold Medford and score by Bernard Herman. Be with us again next week at the same time when we present Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you... Suspense. Suspense. Columbia's play theater of outstanding thrillers. Produced and directed by William Spear and scored by Bernard Herrmann. The notable melodramas from fiction and stage and screen, from the world's great literature of entertaining excitement, 
presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in suspense. Tonight's adventure in suspense is from the pen of Dorothy Sayers. She called it the Cave of Alibaba. Like the tale told by Scheherazade, a distinguished ancestress in the storytelling art, Miss Sayers' thriller deals with 40 thieves and with two magic words. For your uneasy listening, then, suspense presents The Cave of Alibaba. On a Saturday afternoon in January, in a grim and narrow house in Lambeth, a man sat eating kippers and reading the daily paper. He was smallish and spare, with brown hair rather too regularly waved and a strong, brown, pointed beard. His double-breasted navy blue suit, his socks, tie, and handkerchief were all scrupulously matched, and his brown boots just a trifle too highly polished. He did not look a gentleman, not even a gentleman's gentleman. Yet there was something about his appearance which suggested that he was accustomed to the manner of life in good families. A superior butler, perhaps, yet not old enough to be retired. A footman who had come into a legacy, yes. He had just finished eating, and he was sipping his coffee when a slight noise at the front door caught his ear. Swiftly. Too swiftly for a quiet little man sitting, eating kippers and reading his paper on a Saturday afternoon. He sprang up. He dashed through the small hallway and he flung the door open. Of course, no one in sight. The society is at least dramatic in its delivery of its correspondence. And as if he knew what he would find, he shut the door and turned to the hat stand in the hall. An envelope had been placed there. It was addressed to Joseph Rogers. So Mr. Rogers opened the note. Number 21. An extraordinary general meeting will be held tonight at the house of number one at 11.30. You you will be absent at your peril. The word is finality. Hmm. Finality. Yes, I think so. The man called Joseph Rogers stood for a moment studying the note... Then he strode to the rear of the house to a tall safe built in the wall. Carefully, he manipulated a dial. He swung the safe door open. He stepped inside into a small strong room. He opened a drawer marked correspondence, placed the note inside, and then came out again. A moment to reset the lock for a new combination, and then he went back into the living room. He reached for the telephone. He lifted it from the cradle and then reconsidered. Too dangerous. He hurried upstairs and clambered into an attic. In the furthest corner, he searched for and found a knot hole in the woodwork. He pressed it. A concealed trapdoor swung open and he was in the loft of the adjoining house. He paused before three cages, in each of them a carrier pigeon. Carefully, he wrote a note. Slipped it under a pigeon's wing. There you are, my pretty. There, take it easy now. There you go. Fly straight. 4.30. I'll send another pigeon at 5 and the third at 6. I should have my answer by 9.30 at the latest. Oh, I forgot one thing most important. Mr. Rogers moved through the trap door, back into the attic of his own house, and once again he stood before the tall safe built in the wall. He opened the door, stepped into the strong room, moved for a moment quietly in the dark, and then spoke gently. Now, be good, my sweetheart. I'm depending on you. Open sesame. Come on now, old thing. Open sesame. Open sesame. Ah, That's better. That's very much better. (laughs) 
By 9.30, his answer was back. All the little piece of paper said was a hasty okay. At a quarter before 11, he took his revolver from a locked drawer, inspected it carefully. Yes, loaded it with cartridges from an unbroken packet and left the house. He walked quickly, keeping well away from the wall. And when he climbed on a bus, he sat next to the conductor, where he could watch all who got on and off. By 25 minutes after 11, he was out on lonely Hampstead Heath, pausing in the shadow of a large tree to adjust a black velvet mask on which, in white thread, was stitched the number 21. Then he stepped briskly to the door of the villa that lay before him and... What is it? Finality. Come in. Go right on through. Number one will check you in. Right. Twenty-one, sir. Lift your mask. Very well, twenty-one. You may go on to the meeting room. Thank you, sir. The villa in which Mr. Rogers now stood was a large one, a brilliantly lighted room. There was a gramophone in one corner blaring out a jazz tune. To its rhythm, couples, masked men and women, were dancing. Some were in evening dress, some in tweeds and jumpers. In another corner of the room was the bar. Mr. Rogers went up to it and asked the masked man in charge for a double whiskey. He consumed it slowly, leaning on the bar. The room filled. Presently, someone moved across to the gramophone and stopped it. Mr. Rogers looked around. Number one, the massive gentleman in evening dress who had checked him in appeared on the threshold. A tall woman in black stood beside him. Her mask, embroidered with a white number two, covered her hair and her face completely. Only her, her fine bearing, her white arms, and her... Dark eyes, shining through the eye slits, proclaimed her as a woman of power, of physical attraction. The masked dancers were silent now, as number one spoke. Ladies and gentlemen, we are short two members tonight. I need not inform you of the disastrous failure of our plan for obtaining the plans of the court Wendelsham Heliscoper. Our courageous and devoted friends... Number 15 and number 38 were betrayed and taken by the police. Some of you might fear that under examination these two would break down and give away our society. There is no need for such a fear. I gave the usual orders, and their tongues have been silenced. Their defense will be discreetly compensated in the usual manner. I call upon number 12 and 34 to undertake this agreeable task. They will attend me at my office for their instructions after the meeting. Will the numbers I have named kindly signify by raising their hands that I are able and willing to perform this duty? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your partners for the next dance. The gramophone struck up again. Mr. Rogers turned to a girl near him in a red dress. She nodded, and they slipped into the movement of a foxtrot. The couples gyrated solemnly and in silence. Their shadows were flung against the blinds as they turned and stepped to and fro. The girl in red spoke to Mr. Rogers. What's happened? I'm frightened, aren't you? I feel as if something awful was about to happen. It does take one a bit short. Number one's way of doing things. But it's safer like that. Oh, those poor men. No uh, talking, please. You know the rules. Sorry. In silence, the dance continued. And then it came to an end. And then when it had finished, the dancers came again to where number one sat and waited with tense eagerness for him to speak. Ladies and gentlemen, you may wonder why this extraordinary meeting has been called. The reason is a serious one. The failure of our recent attempt was no accident. 
The police were not on the premises that night by accident. We have a traitor amongst us. This last failure was not the first. You'll remember the unfortunate way in which the affair of the Dinglewood pearls turned out. And there were others. However, I am happy to say that our minds can now be easy. All these troubles have been traced to their origin. The offender has been discovered and will be removed. The misguided member who introduced the traitor to our ranks will be placed in a position where his lack of caution will have no further ill effects. There's no cause for alarm. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your partners for the next dance. Again, the gramophone took up its bizarre monotony, and the masked dancers glided and turned. And their movements were sharper, more staccato. The girl in red was claimed by a tall mask in evening dress. A hand laid on Mr. Rogers' arm made him start. A small, plump woman in a green jumper slipped a cold hand into his. The dance went on. When it stopped, everyone stood detached, stiffened in expectation. The endless interval was over. Number one raised his voice. Ladies and gentlemen, you will no doubt wish to be relieved of the questions on your mind. I will name the persons involved. Number 37. No, no. Silence. I'll never. I swear I'll never. Silence. You have failed in discretion. You will be dealt with. If you have anything to say in defense of your folly, I'll hear it later. Sit down. Number 37 sank down upon a chair. He pushed his handkerchief under the mask to wipe his face. Two tall men closed in upon him. The rest fell back. Ladies and gentlemen, I will now name the traitor. Stand forward. Number 21. Take off your mask. Number 37. This man was introduced to our society by you under the name of Joseph Rogers, formerly second footman in the service of the Duke of Denver, dismissed for petty thievery. Did you take steps to verify the statement? I did. I did as God's my witness. It was all straight. I had him identified by two of the servants. I asked all over about him. The story was true. I'll swear it was. Number 21. Your name has been given as Joseph Rogers. Is that your real name? Answer me. Is that your real name? No. What is your name? Peter Death Breden Whimsy. Silence! My compliments, your lordship. We thought Lord Whimsy was dead. He was killed, so the paper said, two winters ago while shooting big game in Africa. He even left a will, proved of 500,000 pounds. To his mother, I believe, the Dowager Duchess of Denver. Lord Peter Whimsy, indeed. Well-known book collector, man about town, distinguished criminologist took an active part in the solution of several famous mysteries. Taking an active part, if you don't mind. So you deliberately led us to think you were dead and became Joseph Rogers to gain entrance to our society. What has become of the real Joseph Rogers? He died abroad. I, I took his place. And the end of your impersonation to uncover our society. Precisely. I see. The robbery of your own fete on which we congratulated ourselves and which you helped to execute was arranged. Obviously. The robbery of the Duchess, your mother, was arranged by you. It was. It was a very ugly tiara. No real loss to anybody with decent taste. The burglary of the Winthrop Mansion, the theft of the necklace at Covent Garden, the others as well. You arranged them all. All. Uh, may I smoke, by the way? You may not. Numbers 15, 22, 39. You have watched the prisoner. Has he made any attempt to communicate with anybody? Uh, none. His letters and parcels have been opened. His telephone tapped and his movements followed. Even the water pipes in his house have been under observation for Morse code signals. You're certain? Absolutely. Then we may be sure that he has been alone in this adventure. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please take oh, your... Oh, 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 Very well. Take the prisoner away. And be sure you explain carefully to him first... The manner of his death. I am sure he'll enjoy it. Wait. Wait. At least you can let me die d decently. Take him away. Stop. I have something to say. Something to sell. We make no bargains with traitors. No, but listen. Do you think I haven't thought of this? I'm not a fool. 
I've left a letter. To whom? To the police. If I don't return tomorrow, it'll be opened. It's a bluff. The prisoner sent no letter. He's been strictly watched for months. I left the letter before I came to Lambeth. Then it can't contain no information of any person. Oh, but it does. The combination of my safe. It did? Has this man's safe been searched? Yes. What did it contain? No information of importance, sir. An outline of our organization, the name of the house, nothing that can't be altered and covered before morning. And did you investigate the inner compartment of the safe? You hear what he says, did you? He's trying to bluff. There is no inner compartment. I hate to contradict you, but I'm really afraid you must have overlooked it. And what did you say was in the compartment, if it does exist? The names of every member of this society with their addresses, photographs, and fingerprints. How oh, oh, did you say you have contrived to get this information? By doing a little detective work on my own. But you've been watched. True, the fingerprints of my watch has adorned the first page of the collection. That statement can be proved? Certainly. The name of number 40, for example... Stop! 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 If you mention names here, you will certainly have no hope of mercy. Bring the prisoner to my office. Ladies and gentlemen, take your partners for the next dance. Prove that I know your gang from number one through number 25. Do you want me to prove that I know the others as well? My lord, your story fills me with regret that you are not, in fact, a member of our society. Wit, courage, and industry are valuable in an association like ours. I fear I cannot persuade you. No, I suppose not. Yes? Ask the members kindly to proceed to the supper room. Ladies and gentlemen, I will not conceal from you the seriousness of the situation. The prisoner has recited to me 25 names and addresses which were thought to be unknown except to their owners and to me. There has been great carelessness. Fingerprints have been obtained. He showed me some photographs of them. He tells me that the book of names and addresses is to be found in the inner compartment of his safe together with certain letters and papers stolen from the houses of members and several objects with fingerprints. I believe he tells the truth. He offers the combination of the safe in exchange for a quick death. I think his offer should be accepted. What is your opinion, ladies and gentlemen? The combination is known already. Fool! This man is Lord Peter Wimsey, a scientist of crime. Do you think he will have forgotten to change the combination? Oh, I say give him the promise. Time's getting short. Yeah, 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 yeah. You agreed? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a bargain, Wednesday. What is the combination? The word of the combination is unreliability. And the inner door, the inner compartment. In anticipation of the visit of the police, the inner door is open. Good. Number 12 and 36. You will go to the prisoner's house and... No. Why should any more members... No, 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 no. That's right. Uh, I agree. Nobody ought to be trusted. Then what, ladies and gentlemen, do you suggest? You go yourself. You're the only one that knows all the names. You go yourself. I second that motion. Is the wish of the meeting, then, that I should go? No. I say no. No, don't go. Number one is our president, the head and soul of our society. If anything should happen to him, where should we be? You've all blundered. We have your carelessness to thank for all this. Do you think we should be safe for five minutes if he were not here to repair your follies? Well, there's something in that. If you will pardon my suggesting it, the lady appears to be in a position peculiarly favorable for the reception of the president's confidences. The contents of my modest volume will be no news to her. Why should she not go herself? Because I say she must not. If it is the will of the meeting, I'll go. Give me the key of the house. Here. Is your house watched? No. If I have not returned in two hours, act for the best to save yourselves. And do what you like with the prisoner. The president has been gone two hours. Traitor! What's happened to him? How should I know? Perhaps he's uh, looked after himself and gone while the going was good. Liar! He'd never do that. What have you done with him? Speak, or I'll make you speak. I can, I can only form a guess, madam. I'm afraid that your president may quite inadvertently have left the door of the inner compartment closed behind him, in which case... Yes. Well, let me explain the mechanism of my safe. Hmm? The inner compartment has two doors. 
The outermost most opens outward with an ordinary key. Who do you think that the president is so stupid as to be caught in an obvious trap? Undoubtedly, he will have wedged open that inner door. Undoubtedly, madam. But the sole purpose of that inner door is to appear to be the only one. Hidden behind the hinge of that door is another, a sliding panel, also left open. Inside the compartment is the big, heavy ledger containing all the information about this society. This ledger lies on a steel shelf. Uh, do I make myself clear? Oh, yes, 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 go on. The steel shelf is balanced on a concealed spring. When the weight of the book, the ledger, is lifted, the shelf rises almost imperceptibly, and in rising, it makes an electrical contact. Now, let me draw a picture. Your president steps into the inner compartment, sees the book, takes it up anxiously to examine to see if it's the right one. The shelf rises, the electrical contact is made, and the steel panel behind him slides into place. He's trapped. You devil! What is the word that opens the inner door? Quick, the word! Do you remember the story of Ali Baba and the 40 Thieves? Uh-huh. Well, when, <laughs> when I had this safe constructed, my mind went back well, call me sentimental, if you will, to my childhood. The words that open the door are open sesame. Oh. How long can a man live in this devil's trap of yours? Oh, I should think he might hold out for a few hours if he didn't use up all the oxygen by hammering and yelling. I imagine if we go there at once, we'll be able to get him out all right. I'll go myself. I think you'd better take me with you. Why? Well, I'm the only person who can open the door. But you've given me the word. Yes, you have the word. But this door of mine... <laughs> I'm rather proud of it. You know, it's my own invention. It's the latest thing. It will open to the words open sesame, all right. But to my voice only. Your voice? I'll chop your voice from my hands. What do you mean, your voice only? Don't clutch my throat like that. You'll wreck my voice, and then the door might not recognize it. Ah. There, that's better. The door got stuck for a week once, and when I had a cold. Is what he says true? Is it possible? Perfectly possible, madam. It will have a microphone arrangement. Could be done also with light vibrations. We must let him go. Take the ropes off him. Let him go? Nothing. He doesn't go to blab to the police. The president's done in, that's all. And we'd all better make traps while we can. It's all up, boys. Right. Chuck this fellow down the cellar and fasten him in. I'll go and destroy the ledgers. 32, you know where the switch is. Give us a quarter of an hour to clear, then you can blow the place to glory. No. No, you can't leave one to die. He's your president, your leader. I won't let it happen. I won't. I'll free this man myself. Here, none of that. Let me go. Let go of me. Think, Lost, and think. It'll be light in an hour or two. The police may be here at any moment. Police? Oh, yes. Yes, you're right. No, we mustn't imperil the safety of all for just one man. He himself would not wish it. Throw this man in the cellar and let's get out of here while there's time. Here. Uh, this is good enough. Leave him here. Right. Uh, uh, let's go. Hey, you chaps. Yeah? Should have gagged him. I say, it's lonesome down here in this cellar. You might at least leave the light on. Don't worry about the dark. That ticking you here is the time choose uh-huh. for the bomb that's going to blow out this place. It's all set. You won't have long to wait. Uh, not <laughs> long. <laughs> Who is it? Who's there? Shh. Hold still. So I can cut the ropes. Well, if it isn't two. My compliments, madam, on your loyalty to your presence. Quick, quick. They've set the time fuse. The house is mine. Follow me as fast as you can. Number one must be saved. And only you can do it. Well, how did you manage to? There's no time for questions. Get up and follow me. You will release him. You promise. I promise. But I warn you, madam, that this house is surrounded. When my safe uh, door closed, it gave a signal to Scotland Yard. All the members of the society had taken. Never mind them. Here, outside. Is that you, Inspector? Get your fellows away, quick. The house is going up in a minute. Quincy! Lord Quincy! It's Inspector Parker, old man. Are you all right? I'm a bit winded. What's happened, Inspector? Well, about half a dozen of them got blown up. The rest we bagged. Uh, hurry. We must hurry. Who's this? 
for one of the gang. She's called number two. We must save him. We must. Golly, I clean forgot the gentleman in the safe. Parker, where's your car? It's down the lane. Send for one of your men down to get it. It's right. Nice. Johnson, bring that car here. Yes, sir. I've got the, the number one of the whole company quietly asphyxiating at home. I promised we'd get back and save him. He's the bloke that we've been wanting. The man at the back of the Morrison case and the Hope Wilmington case and hundreds of others. <laughs> Is it? Hmm, quite a contraption. Yes, I only hope he hasn't upset the adjustment by something oh, like it. Oh, please, Harry. I hope you haven't heard my voice. Oh, you sound all right. Uh, I can only be conversational. Come on, old thing. Show us your paces. Open sesame. Open sesame. Confound you. Open sesame. Open sesame. He's dead. Let me see. No, he's not. He lived to stand his trial. So, all's right with the world, as it always is when Lord Peter Whimsey is involved. The Cave of Alibaba by Dorothy Sayers was the story which gave us tonight's suspense. Suspense is produced by William Spear. Our guest director for this evening was Robert Louis Sheehan. Tonight's radio drama was written by Peter Lyon and scored by Bernard Herman. Romney Brent was Peter Whimsey, William Moulton played number one, and Ira Gerald, the lady in the case. Others in the cast were Kathleen Cordell, Victor Beecroft, Roland Bottomley, J.W. Austin, William Podmore, Ian Martin, and William Malton. Next Wednesday, suspense will not be heard because of a special all-star Hollywood broadcast which Paramount Pictures will present. Two weeks from tonight, at this time, Columbia will bring you another selected story from the world's great literature of thrills. Another study in... Suspense. And this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Suspense. Columbia's parade of outstanding thrillers produced and directed by William Spear and scored by Bernard Herrmann the notable melodramas from stage and screen, fiction and radio, presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in suspense.
Good evening. This is Orson Welles. I'm very happy I am to be back in the United States and back on the Columbia Network, even for so short a visit as this one. Back with old friends like Johnny Dietz, who is tonight's director, and Bernard Herman. The Mercury Theater presented tonight's radio play for the first time last year. We came right out then and hailed it as a classic of the medium. Nobody argued the point. A lot of people asked us to do it again, so it's gratifying to get the chance now and to find a favorite of ours in this distinguished anthology of spook shows. Personally, I've never met anybody who didn't like a good ghost story. But I know a lot of people who think there are a lot of people who don't like a good ghost story. For the benefit of these, at least, I go on record at the outset of this evening's entertainment with a sober assurance that although blood may be curdled on this program, none will be spilt. There's no shooting, knifing, throttling, axing, or poisoning here. No clanking chains, no cobwebs, no bony and or hairy hands appearing from secret panels or, better yet, bedroom curtains. If it's any part of that dear old phosphorescent foolishness that people who don't like ghost stories don't like, then again, I promise you, we haven't got it. Not tonight. What we do have is a thriller. It's half as good as we think it is. You can call it a shocker. It's already been called a real Orson Welles story. Now, frankly, I don't know what this means. I've been on the air directing and acting in my own shows for quite a while now, and I don't suppose I've done more than half a dozen thrillers in all that time. Honestly, I don't think even that many, but it seems I do have a reputation for the uncanny. Quite possibly, a little escapade of mine involving a couple of planets, which shall be nameless, is responsible. Doesn't really matter. (laughs) Don't think I disapprove of thrillers. I don't. A story doesn't have to appeal to the heart. It can also appeal to the spine. Sometimes you want your heart to be warmed, and sometimes you want your spine to tingle. The tingling, it's to be hoped, will be quite audible as you listen tonight to The Hitchhiker. That's the name of our story, The Hitchhiker. I'm in an auto camp on... Route 66, just west of Gallup, New Mexico. If I tell it, perhaps it'll help me. Keep me from going, going crazy. I gotta tell this quickly. I'm not crazy now. I feel perfectly well, except that I'm running a slight temperature. My name is Ronald Adams. I'm 36 years of age. Unmarried, tall, dark, with a black mustache. I drive a 1940 Buick license number 6Y175189. I was born in Brooklyn. All this I know. I know that I'm at this moment perfectly sane. That it's not me who's gone mad. It's something else. Something utterly beyond my control. I've got to speak quickly. At any minute, the link may break. This may be the last thing I ever tell on Earth. The last night I ever see the stars. Six days ago, I left Brooklyn to drive to California. Goodbye, son. Good luck to you, my boy. Goodbye, mother. Here, give me a kiss. And I'll go. I'll come out with you to the car. Oh, no, it's raining. Stay here at the door. Hey, what's this? Tears? I thought you'd promise me you wouldn't cry. I know, dear. I'm sorry. But I... I do hate to see you. I'll be back. It'll only be the... On the course, three months. Oh, it isn't that. It's, it's just the trip. Ronald, I wish you weren't driving. Oh, Mother, there you go again. People do it every day. I know, but you'll be careful, won't you? Promise me you'll be extra careful. Don't fall asleep or drive fast or pick up any strangers on the road. Oh, gosh. I think I was still 17 here, you told me. Oh, and why? I mean, as soon as you get to Hollywood, won't you, son? Of course I will. Don't you worry. There's nothing going to happen. It's just eight days of perfectly simple driving on smooth, decent, civilized roads. With a hot dog or a hamburger stand every ten miles. I was in fine spirits. 
drive ahead of me, even the loneliness seemed like a lark. I reckoned without him. Crossing Brooklyn Bridge that morning in the rain, I saw a man leaning against the cables. He seemed to be waiting for a lift. There were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. He was carrying a cheap overnight bag in one hand. He was thin, nondescript, with a cap pulled down over his eyes. I would have forgotten him completely, except that just an hour later, while crossing the Pulaski Skyway over the Jersey Flats, I saw him again. At least, he looked like the same person. He was standing now with one thumb pointing west. I couldn't figure out how he got there, but I thought probably one of those fast trucks had picked him up, beat me to the Skyway and let him off. I didn't stop for him. Then late that night, I saw him again. It's on the new Pennsylvania turnpike between Harrisburg and Pittsburgh. It's 265 miles long with a very high speed limit. I was just slowing down for one of the tunnels when I saw him, standing under an arc light by the side of the road. I'd seen quite distinctly the bag, the cap, even the spots of fresh rain spattered over his shoulders. He hallooed at me this time. Hello! Hello! I stepped on the gas like a shot. That's lonely country through the Alleghenies, and I had no intention of stopping. Besides the coincidences or whatever it was, neither the Willies. Stopped at the next gas station. Yes, sir. Uh, fill her up. Certainly, sir. Check your oil, sir? No, thanks. Nice night, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> it hasn't been raining here recently, has it? Not a drop of rain all week. Oh? Oh, I, I suppose that doesn't done your business any harm. Oh, people drive through here all kinds of weather. Mostly business, you know. There aren't many pleasure cars out on the turnpike this season of the year. I suppose not. What, uh... Uh, uh what about hitchhikers? <laughs> hitchhikers here? What's the matter? Don't you ever see any? Not much. If we did, it'd be a sight for sore eyes. Why? Oh, a guy'd be a fool who started out to hitch rides on this road. Look at it. Then, you've never seen anybody? No. Nope. Maybe they get the lift before the turnpike starts. I mean, you know, just before the toll house. But then it'd be a mighty long ride. Most cars wouldn't want to pick up a guy for that long a ride. And you know, this is pretty lonesome country here. Mountains and woods. You ain't seen anybody like that, have you? Uh, no. Oh, no, not, not at all. I was just uh, a technical question. <laughs> I see. Well, that'll be just a dollar forty-nine with the tax. The thing gradually passed through my mind a sheer coincidence. I had a good night's sleep in Pittsburgh. I didn't think about the man all next day until... From just outside of Zanesville, Ohio, I saw him again. It's a bright, sunshiny afternoon. The peaceful Ohio fields, brown with the autumn stubble, lay dreaming in the golden light. I was driving slowly, drinking it in, when the road suddenly ended in a detour. In front of the barrier, he was standing. Now, let me explain about his appearance before I go on. I repeat, there was nothing sinister about him. He was as drab as a mud fence. Or was his attitude menacing? He merely stood there, waiting, almost drooping a little, with a cheap overnight bag in his hand. He looked as though he'd been waiting there for hours. And he looked up. He hailed me. He started to walk forward. Hello? 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 No, not just now. Sorry. Going to California? No, not today. The other way, going to New York. Sorry. After I got the car back on the road again, I felt like a fool. 
Yet the thought of <clears throat> picking him up, of having him sit beside me, was somehow unbearable. At the same time, I felt more than ever unspeakably alone. After hour went by, the fields, the towns ticked off one by one. The light changed. I knew now that I was going to see him again. And though I dreaded the sight, I caught myself searching the side of the road, waiting for him to appear. Papa! Sell sandwiches and pop here, don't you? Yeah, we do in the daytime. But we're closed up now for the I night. I know, but I was wondering if you could possibly have a cup of coffee, black coffee, just... No, not this time want... of night, mister. My wife's a cook. She's a man. No, no, don't shut the door, please. Listen, just a minute ago... Uh, <laughs> just a minute ago, there was a man standing here right beside the stand, a suspicious-looking man. I, I don't mean to disturb you. You see, I was driving along when I just happened to look, and there he was. How was he doing? Well, nothing. You've been taking a nip. That's what you've been doing. Now, on your way before I call out your folks. I got into the car again and drove on slowly. I was getting to hate the car. If I could have found a place to stop, to rest a little. I was in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri now few resort places there were closed, only an occasional log cabin, seemingly deserted. That's all that broke the monotony of the wild, wooded landscape. I had seen him at that roadside stand. I knew I'd see him again. Maybe at the next turn of the road. I knew that when I saw him next, I would run him down. until late next afternoon. I stopped a car at a sleepy little junction just across the border into Oklahoma to let a train pass by when he appeared across the tracks, leaning against a telephone pole. Perfectly airless, dry day. The red clay of Oklahoma was baking under the southwestern sun. Yet there were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. I couldn't stand that. Without thinking, blindly, I started the car across the tracks. He didn't look up at me. He was staring at the ground. I stepped on the gas hard, bearing the wheel sharply toward him. I could hear the train in the distance now, but I didn't care. Then. Something went wrong with the car. The train was coming closer. I could hear its bell ringing and the cry of its whistle. Still, he stood there. And now I knew that he was beckoning, beckoning me to my death. No. I frustrated him that time. The starter worked at last. I managed to back up. When the train passed, he was gone. I was all alone in the hot, dry afternoon. After that, I knew I had to do something. I didn't know who this man was or what he wanted of me. I only knew that from now on, I mustn't let myself alone on the road for one minute. Uh, hello there. Like a ride? Well, what do you think? How far are you going? Oh, uh, well, where do you want to go? Amarillo, Texas. I'll drive you there. Gee. Uh, you mind if I take off my shoes? My dogs are killing me. Go right ahead. Oh, gee, what a break this is. hitchhike much? Sure, only it's tough sometimes in these great open spaces to get the break. 
Uh, I should think it would be, though. I'll bet you get a good pickup in a fast car. If you did, you could get places faster than, say, another person in another car, couldn't you? I don't get you. Well, take me, for instance. Suppose I'm I'm driving across the country, say, at a nice steady clip about 45 miles an hour. Uh, couldn't, couldn't a girl like you just standing beside the road waiting for a list beat me to town? Or any town, provided she got picked up every time in a car doing from 65 to 70 miles an hour? I don't know. What difference does it make? Oh, no difference. It's just a crazy idea I had sitting here in the car. <laughs> Imagine spending your time in a swell car thinking of things like that. What would you do instead? What would I do? If I was a good-looking fellow like yourself? Why, well, I just enjoy myself every minute of the time. I'd sit back and, and relax. And if I saw a good-looking girl along the side of the road... Hey, look out! Did you see him? See who? A man standing beside the barbed wire fence. Oh, I didn't see anybody. I, it wasn't nothing but a bunch of cows and, and a wire fence. No? What did you think he was doing? Trying to run into the barbed wire fence? a man fence? there, I tell you. A thin gray man with an overnight bag in his hand. And I, I was trying to run him down. Run him down? You mean kill him? Say you didn't see him back there? You sure? I didn't see a soul. As far as I'm concerned... Watch for him the next time and keep watching. Keep your eyes peeled on the road. He'll turn up again. Maybe any minute. There! Look there! Ah! the store work. I, I'm getting out of here. Did you see him that time? No, I didn't see him that time. And personally, mister, I don't expect never to see him. All I want to do is go on living. I don't see how I will very long, driving with you. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't... I, I don't know what came over me, but please don't go. So if you'll excuse me... You can't go. Listen, how would you like to go to California? I'll drive you to California. Seeing pink elephants all the way? No, thanks. Uh-uh, thanks just the same. Listen, stay. please, just, just one minute, please. You know what I think you need, big boy? Not a girlfriend. Just a good dose of sleep. Please. There. I got it now. No, you can't go. Please, come Get your back. hands off me. Do you hear me? Your hands off me. She ran from me. As though I were a monster. A few minutes later, I saw a passing truck pick her up. I knew then that I was... Utterly alone. It was in the heart of the great Texas prairies. There wasn't a car on the road after the truck went by. I tried to figure out what to do, how to get hold of myself. If I could find a place to rest, or even if I could sleep right here in the car for a few hours along the side of the road. I was getting my winter overcoat out of the back seat to use as a blanket when I saw him coming toward me. Emerging from the herd of moving steer. Hello! Maybe I should have spoken to him then. Fought it out then and there. For now he began to be everywhere. Wherever I stopped, even for a moment, for gas, for oil, for a drink of pop, a cup of coffee, sandwich. He was there. I saw him standing outside the auto camp in Amarillo that night when I dared to slow down. He was sitting near the drinking fountain of a little camping spot just inside the border of New Mexico. He was waiting for me outside the Navajo reservation where I stopped to check my tires. I saw him in Albuquerque when I bought 20 gallons of gas. I was... I was afraid to stop now. I began to drive faster and faster. I was in, in lunar landscape now. The great arid Mesa country of New Mexico. I drove through it with the indifference of a fly crawling over the face of the moon. Now he didn't even wait for me to stop. Unless I drove at 85 miles an hour over those endless roads, he waited for me at every other mile. I'd see his figure shadowless, flitting before me, still in the same attitude over the cold, lifeless ground, flitting over dried-up rivers, 
over broken stones cast up by old glacial upheavals, flitting in that pure and cloudless air. I was beside myself when I finally reached Gallup, New Mexico this morning. There's an auto camp here. Cold, almost deserted this time of year. I went inside and asked if there was a telephone. I had the feeling that if only I could speak to someone familiar, someone I loved, I could pull myself together. Your call, please. Long distance. Long distance, certainly. This is long distance. I'd like, uh, <laughs> I'd like to put a, in a call to my home in Brooklyn, New York. I'm Ronald Adams. I'm a, the, the number is Beechwood 200828. Certainly. I will try to get it for you. Albuquerque. New York for Gallup. New York. Gallup, New Mexico, calling Beechwood 20828. I read somewhere that love could banish demons. It's the middle of the morning. I knew Mother would be home. I pictured her tall and white-haired in her crisp house dress, going about her tasks. Be enough, I thought, just to hear the even calmness of her voice. Will you please deposit three dollars and eighty-five cents for the first three minutes? When you have deposited a dollar and a half, will you wait until I have collected the money? All right, deposit another dollar and a half. Will you please deposit the remaining 85 cents? Ready with Brooklyn. Go ahead, please. Hello? Hello? Mrs. Adams' residence. Hello, hello, Mother. This is Mrs. Adams' residence. Who is it you wish to speak to, please? What? Oh, who is this? This is Mrs. Winnie. Mrs. Winnie? I, I don't know any Mrs. Winnie. Is this Beechwood 208828? Yes. Uh, well, where, where's my mother? Where's Mrs. Adams? Mrs. Adams is not at home. She's still in the hospital. The hospital? Yes. Who the... is this calling, please? Is it a member of the family? Well, what's she in the hospital for? She's been prostrated for five days. Nervous breakdown. But who is this Nervous calling? breakdown? Well, my grandmother never was nervous. It's all taken place since the death of her oldest son, Ronald. Death of her... Death of her oldest son, Ronald? Hey, what's this? What number is this? This is Beechwood 20828. It's all been very sudden. He was killed just six days ago in an automobile accident on the Brooklyn Bridge. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up, sir. And so... So I'm sitting here in this deserted auto camp in Gallup, New Mexico. I'm trying to think. Trying to get hold of myself. Otherwise, I... I'm going to go crazy. Outside, it's night... The vast, soulless night of New Mexico. A million stars are in the sky. Ahead of me stretch a thousand miles of empty mesa. Mountains. Prairies. Desert. Somewhere among them, he's waiting for me. Somewhere I shall know who he is and who I am. So ends.
Burns, the hitchhiker, and to Orson Welles, our considerable thanks for his playing of the title role. Mr. Welles, help wanted. Men, women, and children. Nature of work, hard, monotonous, back-breaking labor. Hours, 75 a week minimum. Pay, few cents an hour. Added inducement, two meals a day, including several ounces of bad bread and a cup of thin soup. Don't delay. Apply at once. How would you respond to a want ad like that, Mr. and Mrs. American working man and woman? You'd laugh, wouldn't you, and throw the paper in the trash basket. Dismiss the whole advertisement as some kind of a joke, but believe me, it's no joke. It's a simple statement of the working conditions that exist today in Nazi Germany and the conquered countries under Nazi rule. It's also an exact statement of the working conditions that will be imposed on you and every member of your family if the Nazis win this war. You yourself personally can stop them from winning, as you know. You don't have to give up your well-paid job to do it. You needn't have to be a soldier or a sailor or an airman or a nurse or a war worker to ensure American victory. Uncle Sam doesn't ask plain, ordinary, hard-working citizens like you to give him anything. All he asks, all this he does ask very seriously and very urgently, is that you loan him ten cents out of every dollar you make. That's all there is to it. Lend Uncle Sam a dime to win this war. And he'll pay you back with interest when he's won it. The easiest, most convenient way to lend him these dimes is to enroll in the payroll savings plan. Just tell your boss to deduct 10 cents from every dollar he pays you and lend it to Uncle Sam in your name. Sign up for this simple savings plan today, and when victory comes, you will have war bonds in your pockets instead of Axis bonds on your wrists. Suspense will be heard again two weeks from tonight. Next Wednesday night, September 9th, the Columbia Broadcasting System will present over many of these stations at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime an address by W. Averill Harriman, the United States Land Lease Administrator in London. Mr. Harriman, as the personal representative of the President of the United States, attended the Moscow conferences between Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin. Next Wednesday's broadcast will be Mr. Harriman's first public address since his return to this country. Suspense... <laughs> is produced and directed by William Spear. John Dietz was our guest director this evening. Tonight's radio drama was written by Lucille Fletcher. The original score was by Bernard Herrmann. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Will you give a few seconds of your time to help win this war? Then listen. At Stalingrad the other day, a Nazi tank unit attacked a corps of Russian soldiers. The Russians tried to stop the tanks and fought until their guns were silenced. Then did they surrender? Did they retreat? No. Eighteen of them rushed forward with bombs in their hands, got under the tanks and blew them up. They gave their lives for their country. You and I are not asked to give our lives for ours. All we're asked to do is buy war bonds and stamps. Our American soldiers are giving their lives for us each day. More and more of them every day. Can we do less than loan our money to them? It's such a simple, easy thing to do. Out of every dollar you earn, lend one dime to your country. Do it regularly by joining the 10% club where you work. And do it now. Our soldiers need your help. Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Suspense. 
Columbia's parade of outstanding thrillers, produced by William Spear and scored by Bernard Herrmann. The notable melodramas from stage and screen, fiction and radio, presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in suspense. Tonight's story deals with a remote and dangerous house and a terrifying thing that happened there because the rain went on for days and days. It deals with a surgeon and a girl, a giant, and a young man who took a long chance. And over them all, the moan of the night wind and the ceaseless roar of the storm. For your suspenseful listening, we invite you to learn about Kepler method. Four days of rain had been ceaseless, teeming, pouring with a steady, relentless rhythm. Four solid days. The fields around Culston had been turned into huge puddles that reflected the heavy, swollen sky. And Dr. Morrissey was stirred by a deep anxiety. He stood beside a window in his sanitarium, which rose high on a lonely hill, a few miles from the little town of Culston, and stared into the jagged, spraying screen of rain. It was just three o'clock. Three o'clock of an afternoon he would long remember. He was on the point of sending for Caffrey, the ward attendant, when the door opened, and Caffrey came in, pale, disturbed. Dr. Morrissey. Is there anything wrong, Caffrey? I don't know. There's a feeling down in the ward. Feeling? This rain's going on too long. The patient's getting uneasy? They're bound to, ain't they? If a guy with good nerves, he gets jumpy. You can imagine what it does to theirs. Seem to be affecting anyone in particular? Number five's been carrying on. Kettler? Yeah. I brought him up. Nurse Carter's waiting with him out in the hall. Bad as that? He's upsetting the others. Keeps asking for some guy named Benham. Oh, that's the man he killed. I didn't know he was homicidal. Oh, it was an accident. He was performing a brain surgery on Benham and... Uh... Him? Oh, Kettler was a very important surgeon, Caffrey. Didn't you know that? He keeps saying so, but... It's, uh... it's perfectly true. Very successful, Dr. Kettler was. Until he perfected an operative procedure that he called the Kettler method. A new process of brain operation. Spent most of his life on it and... Well, when he tried it for the first time on this young lad Benham and... Benham died on the table. It, it unbalanced his mind. I've got to go back down there now. I think you'd better wait while I talk with Kettler. Okay, I'll bring him in. But don't make it long. I don't like the feel of things around here. Nurse, Miss Carter. Yes, we're coming. You can bring him in now. Come along. Dr. Morrissey wants to see you. Does he now? Does he? Come in, Kettler. I'd like to ask Dr. Morrissey a question. I'd like to ask him a question. Yes, Dr. Kettler. I should like to ask him where Laird Benham is. I know he'll never tell me. But I will, Kettler. Laird Benham is buried somewhere out there under the rain. He is at peace, Kettler. Can't you forget about him? Just forget. You'd all like me to forget about him, wouldn't you? Then you could keep him hidden away forever, couldn't you? Benham is dead, Kettler. You know that. Benham died. He did not. He's alive. He was alive when you and the rest of the envious medical profession stole him from the operating table. Kidnapped him with my bandages still round his head. You were determined to make the Kettler method seem a failure, weren't you? Weren't you? Easy, easy now. Believe me, Kettler. I think I Benham know died. where he is now, Dr. Morrissey. He's in the cellar under the ward downstairs, isn't he? Isn't he? Kettler. <laughs> Let me see it. Ben, ben. Oh, You'd better take him down, Caffrey. All right. Come along now, sir. I'll take him, nurse. You won't show him to me. Even though it would make me well again. My cellars are empty, Kettler. Believe me, Benham isn't there. You sit there in power and order me away. Come on, Kettler. There's something I have to say. I've always been above violence, Dr. Morrissey. But the time comes when there's no other course. This is a warning, Doctor. A warning. 
And the joke is that you won't heed it. Come on with you. You won't heed it now. But you'll remember it. And soon you'll remember it. Tables turn, Dr. Morrissey. Tables turn. <laughs> Poor thing. Ah, I'm afraid I'm failing with him. Failing completely. But you're not. It takes time to put a man back together. Oh, it's taken me too long with Kettler. I'm beginning to be afraid. If you'll pardon me, Doctor. Yes? I do think you're making a mistake. With him? No, with yourself. You haven't had a real vacation in three years, Dr. Morrissey. Oh, you think I'm wearing a bit thin just now, don't you? And you're right. But I really can't leave my patients in anyone else's hands. Not now, at any rate. No, I'll have to make the best of it. But you need relaxation, Doctor. I know, I know. Well, I hope to soothe my ragged nerves somewhat over this weekend. Oh? I have some friends coming down from the city Friday night. Leslie and Claire Winton. Young married couple, newlyweds. And I'm just going to relax with them and forget everything until Monday morning. You must, Doctor. You do need it so badly. Oh, by the way, Doctor. Yes? I slipped some of uh, those new sample bandages into your coat pocket. Oh, thanks, thanks. I'll have a look at them. I think they're quite good. The salesman said that... Yes, nurse. What is it? Did, did you hear something? Thunder, wasn't it? Something else besides thunder. I thought it... Well, I didn't hear it. <laughs> My nerves must be getting the best of me. Perhaps it's a case of nurse heal thyself, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the only one who needs a rest. You know, it might be a very good idea if we both... <laughs> Dr. Morrissey. I heard that. What is it? It's coming from the ward. Sounds like... That was a shot, nurse. You get on the phone. Call the police at Colston. Hello? Hello. Keep at it, keep at it. Hello? Someone's trying to get in from the hall. Dr. Morrissey! Dr. Morrissey! It's Catherine. Just a moment. Catherine! Catherine, what is it? He's ganged up on me. All of them coming up the stairs. Kittler, clear out of here. Oh, oh. Steady, nurse. He's dead, isn't he? Isn't he? Yes. Dr. Morrissey. Hitler. Remember my warning. Remember it, Doctor. Tables turn, Dr. Morrissey. Tables turn. <laughs> for three more days. Friday night came, black, wet, and glistening. The 815 Express groaned into Colston Station, bringing Leslie and Claire Winton out from the city with their weekend luggage. Isn't Dr. Morrissey sending his car for us, Leslie? Yes, Claire. The chauffeur was supposed to drive us over to the sanitarium to pick up the dock, and then we're all going over to his house together. Well, I don't see any car, do you? I don't see anything but water. Maybe we're rowing over in a skiff. <laughs> oh. Oh, I hate that sound. Like somebody's in agony. I think you're a little depressed, dear. Well, I shouldn't be surprised. My head's still aching dreadfully. Poor lover. How long's that been going on now? Almost a week. It, it frightens me. I don't think it's anything serious. Waiting in the rain like this doesn't do it any good, I'm sure. I don't understand. Doc's usually so punctual, right on the dot. You don't suppose we ought to call the sanitarium... You and... people for Dr. Morrissey, yes? Well, uh, yes, yes, we're the Wintons. Doc sent you to pick us up? I, Cato, Dr. Morrissey's chauffeur. You got luggage? Um, yes. Here it is. I take. You follow me to car. Come. Uh, we're coming. Leslie? Yes? He's, he's tremendous, isn't he? He must be six and a half feet tall. I'm over six myself, darling. He's nearer eight. That's a giant. Get those shoulders... He could snap me in two like a matchstick. Well, I... I hope he likes us. So do I, light of my life. Ah, waiting. 
You come, please. But I really don't think he does. <laughs> Coming. Every car lurched and hurtled over the rain-soaked roads, tearing wildly through the dark and careening up the hillside toward the stark walls of the sanitarium. It skidded to a standstill in front of the main entrance, and cold, black Cato led them inside. The brightly lit corridors were deserted, silent, like hallways in a nightmare. Claire was aware of her headache growing steadily worse as Cato opened the double doors and ushered them into the waiting room. You'll tell Dr. Morrissey we're here, huh? Doctor, be with you soon. You do not go away. Yes, uh, thanks. I hope we're not staying in here very long. It isn't very cheery, is it? Oh, I don't like places like this. I suppose it's very foolish of me, but... But I always feel as if I'm in some sort of danger. That's the headache again. Everything seems worse than it really is when you're not feeling well. Don't you always find... Leslie. Yeah? Listen. What is it? Somebody's knocking. Just a moment. Gracias, adios. Who is it, Leslie? I, I don't know. What, you do not know me? I am Arturo Alvarez, the South American pianist... You have heard of me? Well, sure, I've heard of Arturo Alvarez, but I'd hardly expect to find him Leslie, in... Leslie, uh, humor him. Oh, of course, for a moment I forgot where I was. I've uh, heard of you, Mr. Alvarez. Is there anything I can do for you? Will you help me? I must get out of this place. Oh, sure. I came here several days ago to be treated for a mild nervous trouble. And now, now they won't let me go. I am being held a prisoner... And tonight I am scheduled to give a concert at Carnegie Hall, and I must get out of here. Please, will you help me? Ah, number ten out of the ward again, I see. How many times must I tell you that, that is strictly against the rules? I was doing nothing wrong. I was only telling this gentleman that I must be at Carnegie Hall for my concert. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sure the gentleman was very interested. Uh, Cato. Yes, uh, Doctor. Cato, you will escort number ten back to the ward and see to it that he doesn't wander back into the waiting room. No, no, I will not be taken back to the ward. Help me. Oh, no. Help me. Oh. No. Oh. No. No. Oh. I will no. No. Uh, how strongly he believes in his delusion. Strange fantasy of a diseased mind. Seriously believes that he's Arturo Alvarez. He was telling me. Oh, I, I'm very sorry. I'm afraid I haven't been very cordial. Uh, won't you sit down? Is there anything I can do for you? Well, you see, Dr. Morrissey invited us up for the weekend. Oh, yes, of course. He told me he was expecting you. Does he know we're here? I'm afraid not. Uh, Dr. Morrissey was unexpectedly called away on an emergency case, and I'm in charge of the sanitarium until he returns. Well, do you have any idea about when that'll be? Well, it's very hard to say. However, he asked me to ask you to wait and see to it that you're made comfortable. Uh, let me see now. Your name is... Winton. Uh... Leslie Winton. And uh, this is my wife, Claire. Ah, yes. Uh, permit me to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Kettler. Dr. Morrissey's assistant. Uh, what can I do for you? A bite of food or a drink, perhaps? I don't think so. There's nothing in the world I want so much as an aspirin. Aspirin? Yes, Doctor. She's had a headache that's been troubling her for days. It's terribly annoying. I can well imagine. Annoying and interesting. That is, to a man of my profession, of course. But if you will step into the inner office, I think I can offer you something a good deal more effective. Oh, I hate to trouble you. No trouble at all. I find these things most intriguing. Should I, Leslie? I think you might as well. Morrissey won't be back for a long time by the looks of things. You're quite right, Mr. Winton. Dr. Morrissey won't be back for a long, long time. Oh, well, then, uh, which way do I go? Right this way, the large door on your left. You won't mind waiting alone, will you, darling? Oh, Mr. Winton shall make himself comfortable. There are cigarettes in the box, whiskey in the liquor cabinet, and a radio behind the ferns there. I'm sure he will be quite happy. Uh, after you, Mrs. Winton. If Dr. Morrissey comes in, let me know. I hope you'll find everything you want, sir. Thanks. Uh, by the way, Doctor. Yes? You said you had something better than aspirin. I didn't know there was anything better than aspirin for a headache. I have something, Mr. Winton. Really? It is a process which I invented myself. One that never fails. A little treatment, very effective, 
and highly complicated called the Kettler Method. Please make yourself at home, Mr. Winton. Leslie sat there, alone in the big waiting room for a while. Then creeps began setting in, and he thought to himself, Maybe I'll have that drink after all. He rose and went over to the liquor cabinet that Kettler had pointed out to him and opened it. Well, there's nothing in here but books. Yes, books. Books that were so thick with dust that it was clear they'd been there for months. Well, no drink for Leslie. Maybe a cigarette. Kettler said the box was full. He picked it up and started opening it. Why, it isn't even a cigarette box. The darn thing's a bookend. Yes, that's just what it was. Leslie began to think it was a tough job making himself at home in that waiting room. And then the idea occurred to him. Maybe the radio works. He went over to the radio then, turned it on, and... We are sorry to announce that the program scheduled for this time from Carnegie Hall has been cancelled due to the mysterious disappearance of Arturo Alvarez, the noted South American pianist. Mr. Alvarez was known to be suffering from a minor nervous disorder and was last seen departing on a short trip to Colston in upstate New York. Alvarez. That guy is Alvarez. What's going on here? Claire, Claire! Locked. Dr. Kettler, open this door. Open it, do you hear me? Miss Claire. Winton. Oh, you. Tell him to open up. Tell him, tell him. Doctor, send me. Tell you, young lady, headache, bad. Very bad. What do you mean? He operate. Operate? He say, take long time. He say, you not wait. You come back tomorrow. Operate? No, no. Kessler, Kessler. Claire, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Of course she can hear you, Mr. Winton. The operating table is just inside the door. Bring her out here. Let her go, I tell you, Kettler. But I find that an operation is indicated, Mr. Winton. I forbid you to touch her. You forbid? You? I'm in charge here. No one forbids me. Do you understand? You're insane. You're... If you lay your hands on her, I'll kill you. So help me, I'll kill you. Very well, Mr. Winton. If you do not wish me to operate, that's all there is to it. I would scarcely force my service upon you. However, the girl's condition is quite serious, and I... Claire. Ah, good work. Good work, Cato, my boy. A masterstroke. Ah, do you still forbid me, Mr. Winton? Do you? Do you? Oh, you don't answer. Good, good. Take him to the cellar, Cato, and lodge him there with his friend, Dr. Morrissey. They should have a good deal to talk over in the still hours of the night while I cure the young lady's headache unmolested. You've got to pull yourself together, Leslie. Now try. Try to think. Akato brought you down a few moments ago. You've been hit in the head. Can you remember? Yes. I was talking to Kettler, trying to make him let Claire go. Claire! Oh, good Lord, Morrissey. Where is she? He's got her. Kettler? She's on that operating table up there. We've got to do something. We've got to do something. Well, I'm afraid there's not much we can do. I've been here for three days and nights. What happened? Ah, uh, it was a nightmare come to life. I'd had Kettler in my office for treatment. Yeah? He was off on a wild tangent, insisting that I had a man whom he had killed hidden down here in the cellar. That I and the rest of the medical profession had kidnapped him off the operating table with his head still swathed. He thinks I've been keeping this venom from him all along, even though I've known that just one side of him would cure his mental disorders. He hates me with every fiber of his twisted brain. He's a dangerous case, Leslie. He'll... He'll kill Claire? He may. There's a slim chance he won't. What's that? Well, all the surgical instruments are locked away. It's possible they may not be able to find them. Isn't there any way we can get out of here? Well, wouldn't I have used it? Where does that corridor lead to? To the staircase that goes to the first floor. Well? Not a chance. It comes out in the operating room and they keep that door locked as tight as a drum. Besides, Kettler still has the pistol he took from my nurse. I've got to think. I've got to. And my head hurts so I can't make good sense. Let's see that. I think they gave you a nasty cut. Oh, it doesn't matter. Say, Doc. Yes? What was his name? 
Who? The guy Kettler thought you were keeping from him, the one he killed. Benham. Laid Benham. Why? Was he a young fellow? Yes, a uh, rather tall, slender chap. Say, Doc, hmm? do you have any bandages down here? What? Bandages. Why, yes, I think so. They're, they're stored down here. Enough to bandage my whole head, face, and everything? Why? I might have a chance of getting through that door up there. <laughs> Let me go now. Oh, let me go. Leslie! Leslie! You will be better soon. Much better. I will take the pain away, Mrs. Winton. Cato, hmm. have you found the surgical case? Not found yet. I look. Cato, look. Find it. We must not keep Mrs. Winton in an agony. Find it, I say. She'll have to create some order in this place. I want my instruments at hand on a moment's notice. Please! Let me go! Oh, let me go! You shall be well again, my dear. I promise you, you shall be. Doctor, here, tall, white cabinet behind curtain. That's it. Open it. Open it, Cato. Locked. Locked, Doctor. Smash it open. Open it. I do. You'll find scalpels on the top tray. Bring them to me. Yes, Doctor. Is here, Doctor. See, knives. Good, sharp knives. Cato find. He find them. Excellent. How they glitter. Ah, uh, it is good to feel the knife in my hand again. Put the others right beside my pistol here on the table. Please. Oh, please! There, there, my girl. I shall expend all my genius on you. You shall be well again. No! 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 Now to work. What was that? Who's there? Dr. Kettler. Who is it? I have found my way back to you. Open the door, Dr. Kettler. I've come back again. Who are you? You remember? You remember Laird Benham? Cato! Cato! Yes, Doctor. The door! The door! Let him in! He's come back! Let yes, him in, I yes, say! Doctor. Oh, let me out of here! He's come back! He's come back, Cato! Benham, I knew it. I knew it all along. You're alive. You're living. Yes. Living. Yes, Dr. Kettler. You. Just as they took you from the table. Yes. They took me away before the operation was complete. Finish it now. Hurry. I can't live much longer. I'm about to die. No, no. Cato, get Benham out of the table. Girl, girl on table. Take her off. Take her out of here. Put her in the uh, cellar. Let Benham take a place. At once, you hear? Yes, Dr. Cato. No, no, I won't be put in the cellar. I won't. It might be well if you went down into the cellar, you know. It's nice down there. You'll see old friends, perhaps. Old friends who need help. Leslie. Hurry, hurry, I say. Yes, Doctor, come. I'm coming. Are you all right, Benham? We can. We can. Cato, Cato. Cato, close door. No, stop wasting time. Leave the door alone. Help me. Help me get Benham on the table. Yes, Doctor. Cato, do. Oh, that's right. I lift him carefully. Yeah. Uh, good. Oh. Now, lie back. Lie back. Gently. Gently. All right. Careful now. There we are. Cato, give me the knife. Yes, Doctor. Take off the bandages. Hmm. From the top, Cato. Uh, That's correct. That's proper procedure. There. Yeah, now that's... Hmm. I thought his hair was blonde, not black. Well, perhaps I've forgotten. I've forgotten so many things that... There was a scar on his forehead. I, I clearly remember a scar on his forehead. Well, maybe. Maybe I imagine that too. Perhaps it was someone else who. Brown eyes. Benham. Benham, didn't you have blue eyes? I know they were blue. And your nose. Your nose was thinner and longer. Yes. 
Yes. And your lips. You had thick lips. That I know. Bandages off, Doctor. Dr. Kettler, there's a trick here. You... You're not Benham. You're not Benham. You're that young Mr. Winton. Dr. Kettler, listen to me. Cheat. Cheat. So you wanted me to finish you, did you? Yes, Mr. Winton, I will. I will. Hold him, Cato. Uh, Hold him. See the knife, Mr. Winton? Watch it glisten as it comes down, 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 and into... Doubt that he's Arthur Alvarez when you hear him play the piano, do you? That's a marvelous old instrument you have, Doc. It was my mother's. This old house has been in the family for generations. Mm. Who'd ever thought we'd be alive to sit in your house and listen to somebody play a concerto? We wouldn't have been. At least I wouldn't have been if you hadn't snatched that revolver off the table right out from under Kettler's nose before they threw you into the cellar. That was the lifesaver. Made the weekend perfect. <laughs> I'm afraid it wasn't very restful. Hereafter, I'm spending all weekends in a cozy little corner under the L. (laughs) Ah, it was worse for Claire than anybody. She had a dreadful time. It was ghastly, all right. Horrible. But you know something? What? My headache. It's completely gone. The Kettler Method, the tale of a memorable weekend and a long-awaited dead man who didn't return after all. This was tonight's story of Suspense. Suspense is produced by William Spear. John Dietz was our director this evening. Tonight's radio drama was written by Peter Barry and scored by Bernard Herman. Roger DeCoven was Dr. Kettler, John Gibson, Leslie Winton, and Gloria Stewart played Claire Winton. Others in the cast were Guy Rep, Martha Faulkner, Winfield Honey, and Ralph Smiley. Next week at this time, Columbia will bring you another selected story from the world's great literature of thrills. Another study in... Suspense. This is Barry Kroger, and this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Suspense. Columbia's Parade of Outstanding Thrillers, produced by William Spear and scored by Bernard Herrmann. Notable melodramas from stage and screen, fiction and radio, presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in suspense. Tonight's story, by the noted American author T.S. Stribling, deals with a crime of murder on an exotic and atmospheric island, with ragged beggars who slept in a Hindu temple and awoke with gold in their pockets, 
and a dead girl lying near them, and with a strange and mystical entrance into the life of hereafter, which was the experience of an American psychologist. For your suspenseful listening, we invite you to join us for A Passage to Benares. In Porto, Spain, in Trinidad, at half past five in the morning, Mr. Henry Pajoli, an American psychologist, stirred uneasily, became conscious of a splitting headache, opened his eyes in bewilderment, and then, with a shock, saw where he was. He got up, arranged his clothing. He tried with his neat psychological mind to recapture his dream, to bottle up again the little smoking wisps that still floated about within his aching head. By seven o'clock, he had found his way back to the house of Mr. Lowe, his host in Port of Spain. Lowe was already about his coffee with an interested spoon poised above the morning paper. Ah, there you are. Good morning, Borgioli. I say, you are quiet. Didn't hear you get up at all. Have some breakfast? Thanks. I have uh, been out for a breath of air. What's the news today? Well, the new governor will arrive in Trinidad on the 12th, and, uh, uh... Hello. Now the natives killed his wife. Tell me, Pajoli, as a psychologist, why do coolies kill their wives? Oh, for various reasons, I imagine. Let's hear some of the facts. Oh, I say this is a coincidence. Really putting on a show for you, Pajoli, on your first visit to Trinidad. How so? Well, you... You remember that wedding procession you and I watched last evening down, yeah. the, down at the Hindu temple? The temple? Oh, of course. The cream-colored little bride with the breastplates and the linked gold coins and the anklets and all the finery. Mm-hmm. And the bridegroom. What did you say his name was? Budman Lal? Yes. Well, do you know what's happened? Budman Lal is in jail this morning, and his cream-colored little bride is dead with her throat cut. No. Do they think he did it? No doubt of it. That's why he's in jail now. He always seemed like a sensible fellow, too. One of our best patrons. Which only proves my contention, Pajoli. A bridegroom of only six or eight hours killing his wife without any reason at all. Oh, there's usually some reason for murder. Maybe. But I say, oh boy, you're, you're missing the point completely. How? Well, suppose you actually had gone and slept in the temple there last night. Mm-hmm. You wanted to, you know. Remember? And I said... No white man ever stays all night in a coolie temple. You remember? Yes, I remember. You said it simply isn't done. Well, if... If you had, Pajoli, I say, uh... That would have been a pretty kettle, wouldn't it? Yes. Yes. Well, I'm afraid I'll be mixed up in this. Both Mr. Lal and his uncle, Hira Das, are clients of mine. Old Hira Das has upwards of five million dollars in my bank. Hira Das... Didn't you tell me he built that temple where the murder took place? Yes. It's what the Hindus call a temple and rest house. Hiradas gives rice and tea to any traveler who comes in for the night. It's an Indian custom to help mendicant pilgrims. A rich Indian will build a temple and rest house just, just as you Americans erect libraries. Ah. What does it say there about the murder, though? Um, Budman Lal, nephew of the famous Mr. Hiradas was arrested early this morning at his home for the alleged murder of his wife, whom he married yesterday. The body was found at six o'clock this morning in the temple where the wedding ceremony took place. The temple attendants gave the alarm. The victim's head was severed completely from her body and all her jewelry was gone. Five coolie beggars who were asleep in the temple when the body was discovered were arrested. They all claimed ignorance of the crime... But a search of their persons revealed that each beggar had a piece of the bride's jewelry and a coin from her necklace. Mr. Budman Lal and his wife were seen to enter the temple at about 11 last night for the Hindu rite of purification. Mr. Lal, who is a prominent curio dealer, declines to say anything further. Doesn't tell you very much, does it? Ah, not much. What do you make of those beggars? Oh, that's simple enough. Those devils laid in wait inside the temple until the husband went out and left his wife. Then they murdered her and divided the spoil. 
Ah, but she had enough bangles and G-jaws to give a dozen to each man. Yes, yes, you're quite right, Bojoli. That's a fact. Why should they continue sleeping in the temple after they'd killed her if they did murder her? Well, why shouldn't they? They knew they'd be suspected and they couldn't get off the island without capture, so they thought they might, might as well lie down again and go back to sleep. Hmm. You may be right, Lowe, but that doesn't look like the solution to me. Well, I'm satisfied that's how it occurred. You mean the beggars killed her? Mm-hmm. Well, I don't think so. I rather fancy that the actual murderer took the girl's jewelry and went about the temple thrusting a bangle and a coin in the pockets of each of the sleeping beggars to lay a false scent. Oh, come now. That, that's laying it on a bit too thick, Bojo. <laughs> My dear Lowe, that's the only possible explanation for the coins in the beggar's pockets. I say, oh boy, you've had lots of experience in these things. Come along with me and we'll go up and see Mr. Hyrat Daz and see if we can't help his nephew. I'll be glad to. But we'll go to the temple first. Then we'll call on Mr. Hyradas. Well, here we are. In spite of the police guard at the door, the temple doesn't look sinister in the daylight. No, yeah, it just looks dirty. Uh, let's go in and question the beggars. Hey, excuse me. Uh, did any of you fellows hear noises in this temple last night? Oh, much sleep, Saeed. No noise. Policeman Pancho's wake this morning makes it still here. What's your name? Shuda Chan, Saeed. When did you go to sleep last night? When I ate rice and tea, Saeed. Mm-hmm. Do you remember seeing Boudman Lal and his wife enter this building last night? Uh, yes, remember, Saeed. Did you see them go out? Uh, no, Saeed. No one remember go out. You were all asleep then, huh? Yeah, all asleep, yeah, Saeed. Did you have any dreams during your sleep? Hear any noises? Uh, I dream bad dreams, Saeed. Huh? When policeman punched me awake this morning, I think dream has come true. And me, Saeed. Me, too. Me, did you all have bad dreams? Yes, all oh, have bad all dreams. Have bad. Look here, Pajoli, I, I, I don't see where this is getting us. I do think we ought to be getting on to old Haradaz's house. No, I think we can now entirely discard the theory that the beggars murdered the girls. On what grounds? They told you nothing except that they all had bad dreams? That's the reason. They all had wild, fantastic dreams. That suggests that they were given some sort of opiate in their rice or tea last night. It's quite improbable that five ignorant coolies would have wit enough to concoct such a piece of evidence as that. Mm, that's a fact, but I don't believe a Trinidad court would admit such evidence. We're not looking for legal evidence. We're after some indication of the real criminal. Now I suggest that we get onto the house of Hiradas. Please come in, gentlemen. I've been expecting you. Please be seated. Thank you. Thank you. A most mysterious murder in the life of my poor nephew will depend upon your exertions, gentlemen. Tell me, what do you think of the beggars that were found in the temple with the bangles and coins? Well, I'm afraid my judgment of the beggars will disappoint you, Mr. Hiradas. Huh? My theory is that they're innocent of the crime. Really? Why do you say that? Because they told me of dreams they had. And all their dreams were very nearly identical. You are not English, sir. No Englishman would have thought of that. No, I'm American with a backlash sprinkling of, uh, of Italian. My name's Pagioli. What is your profession, Mr. Pagioli? You are a detective? No, Mr. Das. I'm a psychologist. Ah. Oh. Your soul is at least groping after knowledge. However, it gropes as a blind worm, Mr. Poggioli, and we must find the criminal who committed this crime and thus restore my nephew, Boodman Lal, to liberty. You can imagine what a blow this has been to me after I arranged this marriage for my nephew. You did... arranged a marriage for a nephew who is in his 30s? Yes, Mr. Poggioli. Mm. I wanted him to avoid the pitfalls into which I fell. Ah, he was unmarried, 
and he'd already begun to add dollars to dollars. I did the same thing. And now, look at me. An empty old man in a foreign land. What good is this house where men of my own kind can't come and sit with me and when I have no grandchildren to romp and play? No. I've piled up dollars and pounds. I, I've eaten the world, Mr. Pajoli, and found it bitter. Now here I am, an outcast. And why don't you go back to India, Mr. Hyradas? Why, Mr. Pajoli, my mind is half English. If I should return to Benares, I'd walk about thinking what the temples cost. How much was the value of the stone set in the eye of Krishna's image? If I would ever be one with my own people again, Mr. Pajoli, I must leave this Western mind and body here in Trinidad. That's um, very interesting and moving, but uh, we were discussing your nephew, Budman Lal. Wait. In searching for the criminal... I would suggest you look for a moneyed man. Let me tell you my suspicions, and you can work out the details. What are they? I went out of the temple this morning to have the body of my poor murdered niece brought here to my villa for burial. I talked to the five beggars, and they told me there was a sixth sleeper in the temple last night. Was there indeed? Yes, Mr. Lowe, a white man. A white man? Yes, Mr. Lowe. All five of the coolies and my man, Buddha, told me it was true. But, Mr. Hiradas, decapitation is not an American mode of murder. American? I... I, I was speaking generally. I mean a white man's method of murder. Uh, that is indicative in itself. I meant to call your attention to that point. It shows the white man was a highly educated man who had studied the mental habits of other peoples than his own. So he was enabled to give the crime an extraordinary resemblance to a Hindu crime. But what motive could a white man have? Possibly robbery, Mr. Pajoli. Or if he were a very intellectual man, he might have murdered the poor child by... Uh, Way of experiment. A murder for experiment? Yes, Mr. Lowe. To record the psychological reaction. Why? Oh, I, I can't entertain such a theory as that, Mr. Hirata. Oh, no. It is too far-fetched. However, it is worth investigating, is it not? Yes, yes. But I'll begin my investigations with the man Guka. By all means, Mr. Pajoli. And in your investigations, gentlemen, hire any assistance you may need. Draw on me for any amount. I want my nephew exonerated. And above all things, I want the real criminal apprehended and brought to the gallows. What do you think of that, Pajoli? White man in that temple. Ah, sounds like pure fiction to me, to, to shield Bob and Lyle. You know, these fellows hang together like thieves. Say, it's a jolly good thing we didn't decide to sleep in the temple last night, isn't it? You know, in my opinion, Lowe, the actual criminal is Boodman Lyle. Ah, same here. I've thought so ever since I first saw the account in the paper. Somehow these fellows will chop their wives to pieces for no reason at all. Lowe, well, what do you know about Boodman Lyle? Well, he, he was born here and has always been a figure because of his rich uncle. Lived here all his life? Uh-huh. Except when he was in Oxford for six years. Oh, he was an Oxford man. Huh? Yes, yes. Uh, there you are. That's the trouble. I don't understand. What do you mean, Pajoli? Well, no doubt he fell in love with some English girl, but when old Hira Das chose a Hindu child for his wife, Budman couldn't refuse marriage. No man's going to quarrel with a $5 million legacy... And then he chose this ghastly method of getting rid of the child bride. Uh, I dare say you're right. I feel sure Bob Munlal killed the girl. George, I'm getting tired of walking. 
There's a cab. Let's hop it and ride the rest of the way. Hi, cabby. A cab. I see. Oh, hi. Well, aren't you coming? You know, I don't feel that I can conscientiously continue this investigation trying to clear a person whom I have every reason to believe guilty. But, man, don't leave me like this. At least come as far as police headquarters with me and explain your theory about Guga, the temple keeper, and the rice. Well, I... I thought I'd go back to your cottage and pack my things. Pack your things? Oh, your boat doesn't sail until Friday. Yes, I know, but there's a daily service to Curacao. It struck me to go there. Oh, but... no, come. You can't run off like that just when I've stirred up an interesting murder mystery for you to unravel. Why, Bojoli, you ought to appreciate my efforts as a host more than that. Well, all right, then. To the police station. Yes, sir. Yes. Hunter, hurry up. Come on, come on. Chief Vickers, uh, this is my friend, Mr. Pajoli. Mr. Pajoli, Mr. Vickers is chief of Trinidad's police force. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, chief Vickers, I've, um, I've asked Mr. Pajoli's counsel in the Budman Lal murder case. And he's already developed a theory as to who is the actual murderer of Mrs. Budman Lal. So have I. Now, in this matter, Chief Vickers, I want to be perfectly frank with you. I'll admit we're in this case in the employ of Mr. Haradaz and are making an effort to clear his nephew, Budman Lal. We felt confident you'd use the skill of the police department of Port of Spain to work out a theory clearing Budman Lal just as readily as you would to convict him. Our department usually devotes its time to conviction and not to clearing criminals. Yes, yes, I, I know that. But if our theory will point out the actual murderer... What is your theory? Mr. Pajoli's deduction is based on the dreams of the men who were found in the temple. So Mr. Pajoli's deduction is based on dreams. It would be a remarkable coincidence, Mr. Vickers, if five men had lurid dreams simultaneously without some physical cause. It suggests strongly that their tea or rice was doped. Now, if you find out what soporific was used, then have your men search the sales record of the drugstores in the city to see who has lately bought such a drug. You will find the murderer. Uh-huh. How do you like Trinidad, Mr. Pajoli? I'd like it very much indeed. You've just arrived, haven't you? Yes. In uh, what university do you teach back in the States? Ohio State. A chair of criminal psychology in an ordinary state university? I'm not a professor. I'm simply a docent, and I haven't specialized on criminal psychology. I, I quiz on general psychology. You're not teaching now? No, this is my sabbatical year. You look young to have taught in the university six years, but then you Americans start young in your land of specialists. Now, are you, uh, Mr. Pajoli, I suppose you're wrapped up heart and soul in your psychology. I am. You'd uh, do anything in the world to advance yourself in the science. I rather think so. Especially keen on original research work. Ah, <laughs> that's what he is, Chief Vickers. Do you know what he asked me to do yesterday afternoon? No, what, Mr. Lowe? Oh, I don't think we ought to burden Mr. Vickers with our household anecdotes. Oh, but I'm really curious. Just what did Mr. Pajoli ask you to do yesterday afternoon, Mr. Lowe? Oh, well, really nothing, nothing at all. It was just a little psychological experiment he wanted to do. And did he do it? Oh, no, 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 I wouldn't hear of it. Oh, as uh, unconventional as that? Oh, it was really nothing, nothing at all. I think I could guess your anecdote if I tried, gentlemen. About a half an hour ago, I received a telephone message from my man stationed at the temple to keep a lookout for you and Mr. Pajoli. A lookout for us? Yes, because one of the coolies under arrest told him that Mr. Pajoli slept in the temple last night. Oh, but that's not true. That's exactly what he didn't do. He suggested it to me, but I said no. You remember, Pajoli, you... You didn't do it. Did you, Pajoli? Did you? You see, he did. Gentlemen, I, I had a perfectly valid and important reason for sleeping in the temple last night, and so I, I can only ask your sympathetic attention to what I'm about to say. Go on. You remember, Lowe, you and I were down there watching a wedding procession. Well, just as the music stopped and the procession entered the building, suddenly it seemed to me as if... as if they'd vanished. Naturally, they'd gone into the building. Oh, no, no, I don't mean that. I'm afraid you won't understand what I do mean. That the whole procession had ceased to exist, melted into a nothingness. You see, that's really the idea in which the Hindus base their notion of heaven, oblivion, nothing. Yes, I've heard that before. Well, 
Our medieval Gothic architecture was the conception of our Western heaven, and I thought perhaps the Indian architecture had somehow caught the motif of the Indian religion, you know, suggested nir- nirvana. That's what amazed and intrigued me. That's why I wanted to sleep in the place. I wanted to see if I could further my shred of impression. Does that make any sense to you, Mr. Vickers? We are not interested why you went, Mr. Pajoli. We know a murder took place in the temple. You, you don't... You can't think that I committed a horrible murder as an experiment. You intellectual chaps do some pretty weird things, Mr. Pajoli. Why, only the other day I was reading about two young oh, intellectuals... Lord. Yes, these fellows I read about also tried to turn an honest penny by their murder. I don't suppose you happened to notice yesterday that the little bride, Maila Ran, was almost covered with gold bangles and coins? Of course I noticed it. But I had nothing whatever to do with her. I I, I did sleep in the temple. By the but... way, you say you slept on a rug just as the coolies did. Oh, yes, I did. And you didn't wake up either, Mr. Pajola? No, no. Then did the child's murderer happen to put a coin and a bangle in your pockets, just as he did the other sleepers in the temple? I don't know. I I haven't looked in my pockets since then. Then please do so now, Mr. Pajoli. Oh, yes. Here they are, Mr. Vickers. You don't happen to have any more, do you? No. I've already been through all my pockets, and I haven't any more. Well, that's something. Of course, you might have expected just such a questioning as this and provided yourself with these two pieces of gold, but I doubt it. Somehow, I don't believe that you're an experienced enough man to think of such a thing. However, we shall see. I suppose you have no objection, Mr. Pajoli, to my accompanying you over to have a little search of your baggage in Mr. Lowe's cottage. Now then, Mr. Pajoli, be so kind as to open your trunk. Good heavens. Mm Mm-hmm. Just as I thought. A trunk tray full of bangles and coins. I'll say one thing for you, though, Mr. Pajoli. Your nerve almost got you by. But you... You can't believe that I did it. Oh. You don't believe I did this, do you? I... I don't. In your trunk, Pajoli. If I did it, I was sleepwalking. God, to think that it's possible that right here in my own trunk... Well, we might as well start back, I suppose. This is all. I'll I'll go back with you, Pajoli. I'll see you through. Somehow I can't. I I won't believe you did it. Thanks. Thanks. You know, Pajoli, you set out to clear Boatman Lal and, well, dash it all, it looks as if you had. No, he didn't. Budman Lal was out of jail at least an hour before you fellows came into police headquarters to see me. Out? You mean that you turned him loose? Yes. How's that, Chief Vickers? Because, Mr. Lowe, he didn't go to the temple at all with his wife last night. He went down to Queen's Park Hotel and played billiards till one o'clock. He called up a few friends and proved that easily enough. My word, that that leaves nobody but... Yes, Pagioli. I don't know anything about it. If I did commit the murder, I was asleep. I don't know anything about it. That's all I can say. I don't know anything about it. Perhaps a rest in jail will help restore your memory. Well, we'll see. Come now, Poggioli, old man. Don't be too downhearted. I promise you, I'll do everything I can. The case against Henry Pajoli having been duly tried by a jury of your peers who have been found guilty and by the powers invested in me, I herewith sentence you to be hanged by the neck until you are dead. To recall a lost dream is the most tantalizing task ever a human brain was driven to. But if I lie still long enough on this bunk, perhaps I can recapture the dream I had in the temple last night. Yes. Yes. It seems to me that the image on the altar moved 
And suddenly the dome overhead was opened and left me staring upward into a vast abyss. For I was alone in endless space. For all creatures and all matter that had ever been or ever would be were wrapped up in me, Parcioli. That was my dream. That's an odd thing. Six men dreaming the same dream in different terms. There must be a physical cause for such a phenomenon. Course. I've got it. Vickers. Flo. I have it. I've solved it. Get me out of here. I know who killed the girl. What is it, my friend? I know who murdered the bride. Old Hira Dodds did it. Now listen. Listen. Go tell Vickers to take the gold he found in my trunk and develop all the fingerprints on it. He'll find Hira Dodds' prints. Also tell him to follow out that opiate clue I gave him. He'll find Hira Dodds and a man to put the gold in my trunk. See if they don't find brass or steel filings in my room where the scoundrel sat and filed a new key. But they've already done that long ago. They have. But certainly. And old Hyradas confessed everything. Though why a rich old man like him should have murdered a pretty child is more than I can see. But why did he pick on me as a scapegoat? Oh, he explained that to the police. He said he picked on a white man so the police would make a thorough investigation and be sure to catch him. He did? Aye. But what I can't see is why the old boy wanted to be caught and hanged. Why didn't he commit suicide? Why? I know why. Because according to his religion, in that case his soul would have returned in the form of some beast. He wanted to be slain because he expect to, expects to be reborn instantly in Benares with little Maela Ran as his bride instead of his nephews. He hopes to be a great man with wife and children. All the things he was not here in Trinidad. Yes, yes, you must be right. Why didn't you come and tell me about Hiradas' confession the moment it occurred? What do you mean keeping me here when you know I'm an innocent man? Why didn't you tell me before this? Because I couldn't. Old Hiradas didn't confess until a month and ten days after you were hanged. So ends A Passage to Benares, T.S. Stribling's tale of mysterious death and death mysterious. This was tonight's story of Suspense. Suspense is produced by William Spear. John Dietz was our guest director this evening. Tonight's radio drama was written by Carol Case and scored by Bernard Herman. Paul Stewart was Pajoli, Barry Kroger was Mr. Hira Das, and Horace Bram played Mr. Lowe. Others in the cast were Alan Hewitt and Guy Rep. Next week at this time, Columbia will bring you another selected story from the world's great literature of thrills. Another study in suspense. This is Barry Kroger and this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Suspense. Columbia's play theater of outstanding thrillers. Produced and directed by William Spear and scored by Bernard Herrmann. The notable melodramas from fiction and stage and screen, from the world's great literature of entertaining excitement, presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in... Suspense.
suspense. Tonight's story, by America's distinguished author, playwright, Owen Johnson, gathers its suspense in a very gentle way. It doesn't have a spectacular finish, garnished with revolver shots. There are no graveyard watches. There's not so much as a single lifeless body, identified or unidentified. It's a tale told in a club room, the Artists and Writers Club in New York. A tale of high-class robbery and suspicion and of how some ladies and gentlemen nervously counted... One hundred in the dark. Ah, that was a fine meal. Me for the club any time. Uh, here, we can all sit here, Freddy. Yes, if you'll just draw up that chair for Mr. Peters. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Here you are, Mr. Peters. Thank you. Uh, do you all know Peters? Uh, this is Mr. Steingall. Uh, how do you do? I know you. Uh, Mr. Goldier? Oh, I, I agree with Matt. Oh, yes, yes. yes. How are you? Oh, you know each other. Yes, yes. And the one who drew up the chair, Mr. Rankin. How do you do? Thank well, you. Well, I, guess, I, I oh, guess we're all acquainted now. Um, to get back to our table discussion, Quinny. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, how about a drink? Who'll join me? Oh, yeah, pleasure. 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 Fine, yeah. fine. Yeah. fine. Yeah. Uh, John. Well, now, Steingall, as I said, there are only half a dozen stories in the world. What is more to the point? There's every reason. Yes, to... sir. What? Oh, oh. Uh, five uh, with soda, John. Yes, sir. Now, now, where was I? Oh, oh, yes. What is more to the point, gentlemen, is the small number of human relations that are so simple and yet so fundamental that they can be eternally played upon, redressed and reinterpreted in every language in every age and yet remain inexhaustible in the possibility of variation. Well, that's true, of course. It's very possible. Take the eternal triangle. Two men and a woman. Or to women and a man. Its variations extend to thousands. That right, Rankin? Well, in a way. Ah, here we are. Uh, set them down right there, John. Very well, sir. Uh, uh, a little soda. Uh, here you are. Uh, thank you. And you? Uh, uh, oh, thank you. Soda, Peter? Yes, please. Uh, there we are. What? Here you are. Thanks. And here's yours. Thank you. And now, a little soda in mine. Uh, well, here's to you all. Mm, cheers. 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 Mm. <coughs> I'm afraid we can't see eye to eye, Quinny. I believe there are situations, original situations, that are independent of your human emotions. That exist just because they are situations. Accidental and nothing else. As for instance? Well, I'll just cite an ordinary one that happens to come to my mind. In a group of five men, well, such as we are here, a theft takes place. One man is the thief. Oh, which one? Now, I'd like to know what emotion that interprets. And yet it certainly is an original theme at the bottom of a whole literature. It's not the same thing at all. Ah, detective stories. I could answer that the situation you give can be traced back to the commonest of human emotions. Curiosity. I think uh, when he has you there, Rankin. Hmm. What is the peculiar fascination that the detective problem exercises over the human mind? You will say, curiosity. Hmm, yes and no. Admit at once that the whole art of a detective story consists in the statement of the problem. Anyone can do it. I can do it. Steingall can do it. Uh, Rankin, I believe even you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> the solution doesn't count. It is usually banal. It should be prohibited. What interest us is? Can we guess it? There you have it. The problem, the detective story. Now, why the fascination? I'll tell you. It appeals to our curiosity. Yes. But deeper, to a sort of intellectual vanity. Five men present. The theft takes place. Who's the thief? Who will guess it first? Whose brains will show its superior cleverness? You see? That's all. That's all there is to it. Out of all of which, the interesting thing is that Rankin has supplied the reason why the supply of detective fiction is inexhaustible. It does all come down to the simplest terms. Five possibilities, one answer. Well, the reason is that the situation does constantly occur. 
It's a situation that any of us might get into any time. Yes, I know of an incident of that kind that happened to a friend of mine last month. Of course, of course, gentlemen. You are glorifying commonplaces. Every crime, I tell you, expresses itself in the terms of the picture puzzle that you feed to your six-year-old. It's only the variation that is interesting. Take the well-known instance of the visitor at a club and the rare coin, for example. You all know that story. You've heard uh, it happen to I don't think I have. I'm not sure. Why, it's, it's very well known. Oh, go ahead, Quinny. Tell it. A distinguished visitor is brought into a club. A dozen men, say, present at dinner, long table. Conversation finally veers around to curiosities and relics. One of the members present then takes from his pocket what he announces as one of the rarest coins in existence. Passes it around the table. Coin travels back and forth, everyone examining it. And the conversation goes to another topic. All at once, the owner calls for his coin. It is nowhere to be found. Everyone looks at everyone else. First, they suspect a joke. Then it becomes serious. The coin is immensely valuable. Who has taken it? The owner is a gentleman. Does the gentlemanly, idiotic thing, of course. Laughs as he knows someone is playing a practical joke on him and that the coin will be returned tomorrow. The others refuse to leave the situation so. One man proposes that they all submit to a search. Everyone gives his assent until it comes to the stranger. He refuses, curtly, roughly, without giving any reason. Uncomfortable silence. The man is a guest. No one knows him particularly well, but still he is a guest. One member tries to make him understand that no offense is offered, that the suggestion was simply to clear the atmosphere. The stranger becomes very firm, very proud, and says, I refuse to allow my person to be searched, and I refuse to give the reason for my action. Another silence. The visitor evidently has the coin, but he is their guest, and etiquette protects him. <laughs> nice situation, huh? Well, what's the well. answer? The table is cleared. A waiter removes a dish of fruit, and there, under the ledge of the plate, where it's been pushed, is the coin. Banal explanation, eh? Of course. Solutions always should be. At once, everyone apologizes to him. Whereupon the visitor rises and says, Now I can give you the reason for my refusal to be searched. There are only two known specimens of that coin in existence. And the second happens to be here in my vest pocket. That's rather obvious. <laughs> of course, the story is well invented. But the turn to it is very nice. Very nice, indeed. Well, I don't know. Ending is very unsatisfactory. The visitor should have hit on him not another coin, but uh, something absolutely different. Something... Uh, destructive, say, of a, a woman's reputation, and a great tragedy should have been threatened by the casual misplacing of the coin. Well, I've heard the same story told in a dozen different ways. Oh, it's happened a hundred times. It must continually happen. I know of one extraordinary instance, in fact, the most extraordinary instance of this sort I've ever heard. Peters, you rascal. I see you've been quietly letting us set the stage for you. Well, it's <laughs> not a story that will please everyone. Why not? Because you will want to know what no one can ever know. It has no conclusion, then? Yes and no. As far as it concerns a woman, quite the most remarkable woman I've ever met, the story is complete. Uh, do I know the woman? Possibly. Probably, I should say. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, this should be particularly interesting to you because <clears throat> I believe that most of you are acquainted with the people involved. Uh, the names, of course, are disguised. I think... Uh, yes, I have. Just time before I catch my train to tell it to you. Mrs. Well, Mrs. Rita Kildare inhabited a charming bachelor girl studio. Very elegant. With a duplex pattern and one of the buildings just off Central Park West. She knew very nearly everyone in that indescribable society in New York that's drawn from all levels and that imposes but one condition for membership to be amusing. In this mingled society, her invitations were eagerly sought. Her dinners were spontaneous, and the discussions, though gay and usually daring, were invariably under the control of wit and good taste. On the Sunday night of this adventure, she had, according to her custom, sent away her Filipino butler and invited to an informal chafing dish supper seven of her more unusual friends. At seven o'clock, having finished dressing, she put in order her bedroom 
which formed a sort of free passage between the studio and a small dining room to the kitchen beyond. Then, going into the studio, she struck a match and was about to light the candlesticks which illuminated the room when the bell rang. And a Mr. Flanders, a broker, compact, nervously alive, well-groomed, was waiting as she opened the door. Well, you're early. On the contrary, you are late. <laughs> well, in any case, hello, and come inside. Here, let me take your things. Thank you. Well, I'm the first, I suppose. Of course. And since you are, you can be a good boy and help me with the candles. Delighted. Who's to be here tonight? The Enos Jacksons. I thought they were separated. Not yet. How interesting. Only you, dear lady, would dream of serving us a couple on the verge. It is interesting, isn't it? Assuredly. Uh, where did you know Jackson? Through the Warings. Uh, Jackson's a rather doubtful person, isn't he? Uh, well, let's call him a very sharp lawyer. Uh, they tell me, though, he's been gambling pretty much. In deep. How about yourself? Oh, me? I'm a bachelor. If I lose my shirt, it makes no difference. Is that possible? Probably even. Who else is coming? Oh, uh, Maud Lilly. You know her? No, I don't think so. You met her here some time ago. A journalist. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I'd forgotten. Mr. Harris, a clubman, is coming, and the Stanley Cheevers. Stanley Cheevers? Are we going to gamble? Don't tell me you object. <laughs> Certainly not. Only the Cheevers. <laughs> they play quite a game. Yes, well united. They have an unusual streak of good luck. Oh, by the way, it's uh, Jackson, isn't it, who is so attractive to Mrs. Cheever? Quite right. What a charming party. Hey, where does Maud Lilly come in? Don't joke. She's in a desperate way. And young Harris? Oh, he's to make the salad and cream the chicken. Ah, see the whole party. I, of course, am to wear the element of respectability. Of what? Don't play baby with me, my dear Flanders. I apologize. That's better. No one, of course, knows who else is coming. No one, of course. The Stanley Cheevers entered. A short, fat man with a vacant, fat face and slow-moving eye. And his wife, voluble, nervous, overdressed, and pretty. Mr... Yes, Mr. Harris came in with Maud Lilly. A woman, straight, dark, Indian, great masses of somber hair, held in a little too loosely for neatness, with thick, quick lips and eyes that rolled away from the person who was talking to her. The Enos Jacksons were late, and still agitated as they entered. His forehead had not quite banished the scowl, nor her eyes the scorn. He was of the type that never lost his temper, but caused others to lose theirs. Mrs. Jackson seemed fastened to her husband by an invisible leash. You looked at her curiously and wondered what such a nature would do in a crisis with a lurking sense of a woman who carried with her her own impending tragedy. As soon as the company had been completed and the incongruity of the selection had been perceived, a smile of malicious anticipation ran the rounds, which the hostess cut short by saying... Well, well, now that everyone's here, this is the order for the night. You can quarrel all you want, you can whisper all the gossip you can think of about one another, but everyone is to be amusing. Also, everyone is to help with dinner. And nothing formal, nothing serious. We may all be bankrupt, divorced, or dead tomorrow, but tonight we'll be gay. That's the invariable rule of the house. <laughs> Bedroom. Oh, thank you, dear. Uh, now for my apron. Oh, there it is. Uh, tie me up in the back, will you please, Maud? Of course. There you are. Fine, thanks. 
And now, just let me get my rings off, and I'll be all ready to go to work. Oh, this is such a lovely apartment, Mrs. Kildare. Thanks. Soap and water always seem to do it. Ah, there. Your rings are so beautiful. They are nice, aren't they? But there's only one that's very valuable, the sapphire. Oh, it's beautiful. Let me see. Oh, oh it must be very valuable. It cost 10000 six years ago. Mm-hmm. It's been my talisman ever since. For the moment, however, I'm a cook. You're not going to leave the rings there. Why, of course. Now, I'm the cook. Uh, Maud Lily, you're the scullery maid. Harris is the chef, and we're all under his orders. Mrs. Cheever, mm. did you ever peel onions? Oh, good heavens, no. <laughs> Well, there are no onions to peel. All you have to do is help set the table. Under their hostess's gay guidance, the seven guests began to circulate busily through the room, laying the table, grouping the chairs, opening bottles, and preparing the material for the chafing dishes. Mrs. Kildare, in the kitchen, ransacked the icebox, and with her own hand, shredded the chicken and measured the cream. Flanders? Carry this in carefully. Cheever, stop watching your wife and put the salad bowl on the table. (laughs) Everything ready, Harris? All set. All right. uh, Everyone sit down. I'll be right in. She went into her bedroom, took off her apron and hung it in the closet. Then going to her dressing table, she drew the hat pin around which were her rings from the pin cushion and carelessly slipped them on her fingers. But all at once, she frowned and looked quickly at her hand. Only two rings were there. The third ring, the sapphire, was missing. Stupid. She said to herself and returned to her dressing table. Immediately, she stopped. She remembered quite clearly putting the hat pin through the three rings. She made no attempt to search further but remained without moving, her fingers slowly drumming on the table. Who had taken the ring? Each of her guests had had a dozen opportunities in the course of the time she'd been busy in the kitchen. She ran over their characters and their situations as she knew them. Strangely enough, at each, her mind stopped upon some reason that might explain a sudden temptation. To find out nothing this way, that's not the important thing to me just now. The important thing is to get the ring back. And slowly, deliberately, she began to walk back and forth, a clenched hand beating the deliberate, rhythmic measure of her journey. Five minutes later, as Harris installed a chef over the chafing dish, was giving directions, spoon in the air, Mrs. Kildare came into the room like a lengthening shadow. Her entrance had been made with scarcely a perceptible sound. And yet each guest was aware of it at the same moment, with a little nervous start. Heavens, heavens, dear lady, you come in on us like a Greek tragedy. What is it you have for us, a surprise? I have something to say to you. Mr. Enos Jackson. Yes, Miss Kilder? Kindly do as I ask you. Certainly. Go to the door. Go to the door? Please. Lock it and bring me the key. There you are. You've locked it? As you wish me to. Thank you. Now, the bedroom door. Would you do the same? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Mr. Cheever. Yeah? Would you blow out all the candles except the candelabra on the table? Blow out all the candles? Except the candelabra. All right. (laughs) For goodness sake, Mrs. Kildare. What is it? I am getting terribly worked up. My my nerves are all in danger. Mrs. Jackson. That's the last candle. All right. Now listen. My sapphire ring has just been stolen. Oh, you don't mean it. The ring's been taken within the last 20 minutes. I'm not going to mince words. The ring has been taken, and the thief is among you. Stolen. But Mrs. Kildare, is it possible? Yes, Mrs. Cheever. There's not the slightest doubt. 
three of you were in the bedroom when I placed my rings in the pincushion. Quite true. I was in the room when she took them off. The sapphire ring was on top. Each of you has passed through there a dozen times since. My sapphire ring is gone, and one of you has taken it. Now, now listen. I'm not going to miss words. I'm not going to stand on ceremony. But I'm going to have my ring back. Listen to me carefully. I'm going to have that ring back. And until I do, not a soul shall leave this room. I don't care who's taken it. All I want is my ring. Now, I'm going to make it possible for whoever took it to restore it without possibility of detection. The doors are locked and will stay locked. I'm going to blow out the remaining candles in the candelabra. And we're going to count 100 slowly. It'll be in absolute darkness. No one will know or see what's done. But if, at the end of that time, the ring is not here on the table, I shall telephone the police and have everyone in this room searched. Am I quite clear? Everyone take his place about the table and uh, remain standing, please. That's it. That'll do. Now, I'll blow out the candles and count 100. No more, no less. Remember, either I get that ring or everyone in this room will be searched. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, <clears throat> twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight. 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, What's 45, that? Foot slumped off the chair, 46, I'm sorry. 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73. The ring. 74. Well, there it is. 75, 76, 77, 78, 79. 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, oh, really? 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, one hundred. Well, well, it is there, isn't it? Oh. Mr. Cheever, you may hand it to me. Well, now that that's over, we can have a very gay little supper. The light, someone. <laughs> There you are, gentlemen. Oh, I say, Peters, that's not all. Absolutely. The story ends there? Story ends there. But uh, who took the ring? <laughs> what? You mean it's never found out? Never. No clue? None. I'm not sure I like the story. Uh, it's no story at all. Permit me, it is a story. And it is complete. 
In fact, I consider it unique because it has none of the banalities of a solution and leaves the problem even more confused than at the start. Well, I don't of see... Of course what... you don't see, my dear Enkin. You do not see that any solution would be commonplace, whereas no solution leaves an extraordinary intellectual problem. Well, how so? Well, in the first place, whether the situation actually happened or not, which is in itself a mere triviality, Peters has constructed it in a masterly way, the proof of which is that he has made me listen. Any of those present might have taken the ring. There are therefore seven solutions, all possible and all logical. But beyond this is left a great intellectual problem. How so? Was it a woman who lacked the necessary courage to continue? Or was it a man who repented his first impulse? Is a man or is a woman the greater natural criminal? Oh, that's simple, Quinny. A woman took it, of course. You know, on the contrary, it was a man, for the second action was more difficult than the first. A man, certainly. The restoration of the ring was a logical decision. You see? Personally, I incline to a woman, for the reason that a weaker feminine nature is strangely susceptible to the domination of her own sex. There you are. We could meet and debate the subject year in and year out and never agree. Uh, I, I recognize most of the characters, Peters. Uh, Mrs. Kildare, of course, is all you say of her. An extraordinary woman. The story is quite characteristic of her. Flanders, I'm not sure of, but I think I know him. I'm positive I do. Did it really happen? Exactly as I told it. The only one I don't recognize is Harris, your humble servant. What? You, Peters? You were there? I was there. I was Harris. I beg your pardon, gentlemen. Oh, yes, what is it, John? Mr. Peters, sir, your train. You told me to remind you. Oh, thank you. Yes, I didn't know it was so late. Will you gentlemen pardon me? Huh? Of course. Of course sir. Nice to meet you all. <coughs> Night. Curious chap. Extraordinary. Well, now, I... I wonder... I wonder if we're wondering the same thing, gentlemen. And so, with the enigmatic smile of Mr. Peters, or Harris, ends 100 in the Dark, Owen Johnson's smooth story which gave us tonight's... Suspense. Suspense is produced by William Spear. Tonight's radio drama was written by Jack Anson Fink, directed by John Dietz, and scored by Bernard Herman. Eric Dressler was Mr. Peters. Alice Frost played Mrs. Kildare, and Ted Osborne, Quinny. Others in the cast were Helen Lewis, Joan Shea, Henriette Kay, Frank Reddick, Paul Luther, Stefan Schnabel, Ian Martin, and Barry Kroger. With this evening's performance, Columbia brings to a conclusion the present series of Suspense. If you've liked these broadcasts, CBS would be pleased to hear from you. Suspense has been a series presented for your relaxation and enjoyment by the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe.